Where is Iran's nuclear program these days? I'm really concerned about that, and I've been watching it for, boy, about 15 years. And for the longest time, the concern was that, well, Iran says it doesn't want a nuclear weapon, but gee, they're sure accumulating a lot of fissile materials, the stuff you make that explodes in a, in a nuclear bomb. In the last three years, we've seen a, a pretty big change with the Iranians. They're now making not just the low enriched uranium, which they were pretty good at making, the stuff you could put in a, a nuclear power plant. Now it's, it's high enriched uranium. 60% enriched. It's very, very close to weapons grid. Sort of telling the world that, you know, wink, wink, we could make a bomb if we want to. And that's not just a bluff anymore. They've got... Joby Warwick, welcome back, sir. It is good to be back and to see the new digs. Holy cow. We're, we're getting there. Last time you were here, you were still in my parents' house. That was when we had the studio there. But I, I got to say, and, and I say this to a bunch of the people who came early on, I, I really, really appreciated you doing that, coming in from out of town, helping build this podcast, You know, taking a shot on me. And that episode was amazing. So well, couldn't wait to do it again. Well, it was so much fun to do. I had to come back. And I must say, it's just it's fun doing this with you. I'm um, Glad to see the thing taken off, and it's great to see this 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 cool studio. It's it's uh it's a big step up. So easier location too. Yeah, for sure. We're up here in New York, so like you were saying, people are here, you know, so we can get some people to pop over. Sometimes it's a little easier than Mullica Hill. Yeah, down there, but it's <laughs> and, coming along. And a fun town too. Hoboken. Yes, great. a lot of fun. It's like quiet and loud at the same time, which is like perfect for me. Yeah, it's right there. So. And you got the Sinatra stamp over everything, which makes it extra cool. That's right. That's right. We even got him in this. I wasn't going to put him in the studio, but then I was like, that picture's too good. Yeah. We got to do it. That's a great picture. The got to do eyes. it. Yeah. yeah. But there's been a lot going on since you've been here. And for people who are not familiar with your background, you are a longtime national security reporter for the Washington Post. You are a two-time Pulitzer winner. And one of those was your book, Black Flags, The Rise of ISIS, which is the greatest history ever written on ISIS. I recommend it to everyone I know. I actually found out from a friend of mine who was in military intelligence that when guys get posted overseas, it's not like they have like required reading lists, but there's like an underground required reading list that they're like, oh, new guy coming in, you need to read this. And that's at the top of it. Wow. So yeah. you certainly left your mark with that. That means a lot to me. And I do hear that occasionally. It's not just from college students, but people who are being deployed in places that have to deal with these issues. So it's it's nice to know that, that they find it valuable. And I think the biggest... Uh, Little f fun factoid in terms of that book was that it's it's uh, if you ever get a chance to go inside CIA, they have a bookstore. It's an employee only thing, but you can buy black flags there, which is really? awesome. <laughs> and my first book is on sale in the Spy Museum in, in Washington. So if you go to the gift store there, you can see that on the rack. So, no kidding. So that's that, kind of fun. that was the one on Albellowy. It's uh, yeah, exactly. It was a CIA operation. Try to get uh, trying to get uh, Al Qaeda's number two. Um, it went terribly wrong, and there was it turns out there was a, a mole in the works uh, working against us from the Al-Qaeda side and killed seven of our people. So that's that story. So I think we talked about that last time you were here. The most fascinating terrorist figure I think I've ever come across. We're familiar with, with bin Laden. Bin Laden and, and Zawahiri and his number two guy, they were of a completely different type. These were people who were professionals. Uh, bin Laden was an engineer. His number two was a medical physician. So they're educated, uh, sophisticated people. They have sort of a strategic vision of this terrorist organization they're trying to create. So Kali was none of that. He was just a street tough. But for people out there, if you've seen Zero Dark Thirty, the scene where the guy comes on and bombs the compound, that's that's essentially that's, what it, that was your story. That's the guy. Yep. Gotcha. And then you also wrote a book that we are definitely going to talk about today at some point called Red Line on the whole Syria issue vis-a-vis -vis the chemical weapons, the aftermath of that, and U.S. diplomacy as a result of that. That mm. was a crazy time right before ISIS. But you cover all this stuff in the Middle East. And I think you were just telling me you were just over there a couple months ago. Yeah. So I've been over twice since the start of the, the Gaza offensive, not uh, not covering the war itself, but just uh, kind of get a sense of what's going on in the region and what's going on now is 
quite alarming, not just in Gaza itself, but what's happening in the in the periphery. We just saw a few weeks ago with Americans being killed on a, on a military base. What happened there? So that was uh, so the the big thing, and it's it's Hamas in Gaza, but it's all these other groups that are on the periphery of of Israel. These are militia groups that are funded by this by Iran. So they give them money, they give them weapons, mm. and they've been provoking our people, the the sort of the bases that we have in Syria and Iraq for a long time, but it really stepped out stepped up after the Gaza um, crisis. And so there was a uh, a rocket attack or a drone attack rather on a on a US base, a base where US officials or US personnel were based and uh, hit a barracks and killed three of our people. And that's the first Ooh. time since the start of the war we've had fatalities because of uh, of these proxy groups. Whoa, I did not hear about that. Yeah. Totally missed that. So when you were over there, where where were you specifically? Yes. Did you go in, I assume you weren't in Gaza, but like, where were you? So we were up on the, mostly on the Syrian border, and that's where a lot of this activity is happening. Syria has become, since the civil war started, it's been more than a decade now, it's 2011 when the war broke out, but it's now completely a failed state. It's become a narco state, and we can talk about that later. It's it's a okay. place where all kinds of bad things and all kinds of bad people are based, and including these militia groups that are funded by Iran, and they hate Americans, and they look for every opportunity to try to, to go after us. They mm. do it in a kind of sort of restrained way because they don't really want to mess with us but they want to tweak us when they can and in this one particular case they they got lucky they sent a drone onto this base and the, the our guys who were watching it come in saw one of our drones returning and mm. so this one was behind it so it actually was pretty good choreography on their part but they ended up just hitting dead on in the middle of a, of a uh, barracks area and killed three Oof. of our guys yeah, whenever I talk with Siri about people, I just picture Mad Max Fury Road. It's that's the thing. It's yeah. essentially because we were talking about it last time, but we look at the map up here on the screen, like there are borders that say Syria. Yep. But the way I've always read it, and I think you kind of confirm this for me, is that there's a bunch of no man's lands there yeah. that are controlled by random groups, everything from the Kurds in the south to just random terrorist groups and all these terrorist groups like don't even like each other so they kill each other too and then Assad is up I guess in like Aleppo and and areas and Damascus and things like that so it, it, it almost seems like we need to redraw the map yeah and the map was drawn for kind of weird reasons anyway this is all the, the way the Middle East looks now with the, the boundaries that do exist it, it didn't happen because there was a river or there was a kingdom here. It was because the British and the French decided wow. at the end of World War I that they were just going to carve up the Middle East into areas of interest. <laughs> and so you know, Syria becomes you know, an area of French interest, interest, and Palestine becomes a British area. Jordan was a British area too. And all these eventually became countries, but the borders and boundaries make no sense because they cut right across tribal areas. So you got people from the same families on both sides. And as you mentioned, the, the the terrain too. Once you get away from the coast, a lot of it's just wild, wide open spaces, rocky deserts, sometimes really harsh areas. And uh, it, one consequence is it's real easy to move stuff and to move bad guys across borders, and it happens all the time. Well, maybe we should start here with Syria because it, it is so fascinating. And like I said, you wrote an entire book on it, which actually I left out there. My dumb, ass, I'll bring that in, but. First of all, how did you when, – when did you first start getting into the Syria story? Like when did you have to cover it for the Washington Post? I assume it was before the chemical weapons were deployed? Yeah, absolutely. So it actually was – really it was the start of the Arab Spring and we're really kind of stretching our, our listeners' memories a little bit. But 2011, you have this – this series of uprisings across the Middle East is kind of like a democracy movement where you have, uh, you know, leaders overthrown in the case of, of uh, say, Tunisia. Uh, in Egypt, you know, a, a, a military dictator is overthrown. So one country after the other has has these uprisings. And they're somewhat successful in the sense that people power succeeds mm -hmm. in a lot of these places. The one place where it didn't work so well was Syria because there's a brutal dictator named Bashar al-Assad who rules Syria with an iron grip. And he decided, well, you guys, you demonstrators aren't going to win. Mm. And I'm willing to do, you know, as be as brutal as I need to be to crush this this uprising. Was he hereditary? He was hereditary, but he wasn't meant to be the, the president. So his dad was the president, was a dictator before him. Mm. And Bashar al-Assad, when, when his, his turn after his father died, it was the, the, the job was actually supposed to go to his older brother, who was like smart, suave guy, mm. had kind of a tough image. 
Bashar al-Assad, being an, a younger son, decided to be a dentist instead and went to to England and got it. He was, was going to school. They said he was going to be, a, sorry, not not a dentist. I misspoke on that. So an ophthalmologist, which is an even even softer <laughs> job. So there's no blood involved, which is the great irony. So he's like the bloodiest tyrant yeah. in the Middle East for decades. And he apparently didn't like the sight of blood, though. So he went to ophthalmology school. But he's- In uh, Britain. In Britain, yeah. Married a British woman. She's of, of Arab descent, but she's very, you know, elegant, beautiful British mm. wife. And uh, and and actually, people had high hopes for him after you know the Arabs before Arab Spring started. Like Americans were going over there and visiting. John F. Kerry went, and other sort of senior Americans went to try to build a relationship and try to make him go the right way and be a little less uh, like his father and more like a normal leader. And that was going very very good for a while until this till Arab Spring happened and the Civil War came about, and then he just became the most brutal tyrant unimaginable and just essentially decided to crush the rebellion with tanks and guns, and, and that's what happened after 2011. Now, I think a lot of people will remember a main focus. Obviously, the Arab Spring was happening all over the place, but a main focus was in Egypt. I think it was, was it Hosni Mubarak? Right. Was that his name? Mubarak. He was overthrown. He was the longtime leader, and that brought in like a whole new government and everything, and then that kind of spread mm -hmm. across all these countries. But when it was happening in Syria... Was there before that happened? Were there already like some of these terrorist presence, whatever you could say, like setting up shop in the country? I'm forgetting some of the names. I know there's like Al Nusra Front, yeah. there's some Al Qaeda affiliates. Yeah. Obviously, it turned into ISIS, some of them too. But like, were any of these guys really there yet, or did that happen? after 2011. So the interesting thing is they, they were there, but they were in prison for the most part. Huh. And, and one of the things that Assad did after the uprising started was to try to turn it into, for public relations purposes, a an uprising by extremists. So he tried to say, well, the people who are opposing my regime, they're fanatics and they're terrorists and, and horrible people. And as a self-fulfilling prophecy, or to kind of make that happen, he actually let a bunch of these bad guys out of jail. Oh my God. And, and some of those ended up kind of reforming into, into groups. But more importantly for the sort of the history of this civil war was they invited their buddies across the border in Iraq. And that's where the real bad guys were. That's the yes. where Zarqawi, who the leader of Al Qaeda in, in Iraq had, had, had developed his movement which became ISIS later. Right. So ISIS came over pretty much by invitation because there was a, there was a war going on. What a great place for a terrorist group to, to, <laughs> to, to thrive. They've got, got plenty of weapons. They've got you know, you know, safe places where nobody's coming after them. A great opportunity to recruit. And so ISIS comes and takes over half the country by the time they've you know, reached their zenith. Like 2014, something 2014 like that? 2014 is the, the year that they sort of established the caliphate and marched into Mosul, the second largest city in, in, in Iraq, and took it over yeah. and declared essentially a, a, a religious empire that spread from the eastern part of Syria across Iraq and an area the size of Great Britain. So if you want to get a sense of how big that place mm. was, it was a, a lot of area under the control of a terrorist group, which meant not just that they're in place there, but they have all the infrastructure of a government. They've got universities, they've got uh, military bases, they've got tanks, they've got bank vaults full of gold, more money than they could ever spend. That's why the caliphate was so dangerous because it, it just was terrorist plus, you know, state infrastructure and wealth and mm -hmm. weapons. And it just made them extraordinarily dangerous. Now, in the middle of all this, I, I mentioned this a few minutes ago, so I'd love to get some context on where they were during this, but... Have you ever read Nadi Murad's book? I know of it, but I haven't actually read that. Okay. Right. Phenomenal book. I never want to read it again because mm. it's it, it's heavy. She won the Nobel Peace Prize. She's a really, really amazing woman. She was a Yazidi who was kidnapped by ISIS. Her mm. family was all killed. She was sold into slavery, the whole bit. But a lot of her story charted out those earliest days of the caliphate for me, like geographically to see where things were. And the crazy part is that on the northern part of Iraq and along the southern part of Syria, there's like the Peshmerga yeah. and, and the Kurds who are these poor people who don't have a country, which yeah. is kind of wild. But like, where are they in all, like, that's what I didn't understand about ISIS being able to get into Syria. They had to go around the Kurds to do that, yeah. right? So did they just let them do that? In the beginning, they didn't have much choice because the Kurds didn't really, you know, they, they had their defense groups, but, you know, ISIS just kind of bulldozed right through there, particularly in areas where the Yazidis are, are, are more, populate, more populous because that's kind of, you know, that's a weak underbelly. So they're able to kind of push right through. The, the Kurds didn't really start fighting back until we helped them. 
mm-hmm. there was this interesting moment in 2014 where uh, a lot of this, the Yazidis in particular were besieged on a mountain and the, the Americans dropped um, first aid and then they began to arm the Kurds in a way that they could start fighting back. And that was the beginning of pushing the ISIS back. Mm. Uh, and and the, when Raqqa, the, the, so the ISIS uh, capital in Syria, was liberated, it was mostly because of these Kurds back with American forces, well, you know, essentially as intelligence and as uh, ISR, like the you know the the drones and and uh, and airstrikes, but they were the the sort of the, the shock troops that pushed ISIS out of those those areas. And the only reason that ISIS hasn't come back really is because of those Kurds and because we still back them today. Yeah, I, I don't want to get off on a tangent there, but I've heard some things about where ISIS is now. It's not dead. Yeah, it's not dead. Which is and scary. It's, and the, the the further you get away from the Kurdish areas, so in Syrian held areas, they're really coming back, and it's pretty long. Oh, even up there? Up there, yeah, except for the northeast corner, which is still kind of a little, Whoa. yeah, So, it, but in Palmyra, which is this kind of a desert city, um, so a little bit, uh, yeah, we can almost see it on the map, but it's it's a, it's an ancient West? Roman city, so it's kind of central, kind of south of Aleppo, but um, but Palmyra was, uh, you know, now you've, it's almost become a no man's land, because um, these ISIS groups, which kind of faded away after 20, um, 2019, have been coming back and they've been, uh, you know, knocking out army posts, you know, threatening soldiers who are in the area. So they flee. And it's uh, it, it's it's pretty disturbing. And people who are watching that closely say there's an opportunity for ISIS to come back, at least in that area. Whoa. Well, Leslie, before I forget, you know, you know the island there with the TV and the drawers below it? I have where the books are. I have red line in there. Would you mind grabbing that? Yeah. And then Joby has two on the chair right outside the studio too. I just want to make sure I have that in here. Sorry about that. And I'm seeing Palmyra. It's just just south of Raqqa. Oh yeah, I see street. it right here. Yeah. You, if if we're looking at the screen right now, I think Alessi has it on that cam. Yeah. So that's do it's south. Kind of like it's like in the first third of the bottom of the TV in the middle, yeah. right there. That was remarkable. Um, area that uh again it was sort of a roman settlement so there's beautiful artifacts and and um Thank you, museums brother. just full of this antiquity uh and isis came in with sledgehammers and just smashed it all up when they took over 2014. They, they just didn't care about it no they just man. they they saw that as idolatry and they just just smashed just really valuable antiques and horrible and, um, artifacts from those times and syria is such a strategic place too because it's one of the countries that actually borders on the Mediterranean, mm-hmm. so it has ports. It shares a border with Jordan. I believe it has a border. Yeah, it has a border with Israel. Yeah, Golan too, Heights. Yep. Right? So this is like almost the cross, and, and then obviously Turkey's up north. This is like the crossroads of the Middle East in a way. Yeah. And in fact, um, people heard the, the term Armageddon, which is yeah. like the mythical last battle of in time. That's based on a city that's actually in Syria. So there's a sense that, really? yeah, in fact, uh, ISIS made a big deal when they took over this little town. This is prophetic. This is end of time stuff. And uh, they've always, it, it, but it, you're right, because it's it's so centrally located just south of Turkey, which is the other big border. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of the crossroads of Europe and the Middle East. And so, so much commerce, so much history, you know, happens through Syria, at least it did when when it was a functioning country. And now that it's a narco state, it's just a great place to send drugs, you know, to, to use it to distribute drugs yeah. into Europe and into the, to the to Mediterranean too. We're going to get there for sure. That blew my mind when you, I don't know anything about that. So we're going to definitely talk about that. But how long have they also been an ally with Russia? I know that's been talked about over the last decade because like Assad is close with him, with Putin, but was was his father also already aligned with them? And, and what's, what's the history there? Yeah, so it's a bit prickly, but the Syrians have always been kind of clients of the Russian state. And as a result of that, you know, they they obviously they, they, the Syrians buy weapons from the Russians, and that makes the Russians happy. But they also have um, the Russians have a navy base in the town of Tartus, which is mm. on the coast. Uh, you yeah. see Latakia, which is the northern coastal town. Tartus is is uh, is is a, a a major port, and it's the only warm water port for the Russians in the world. Whoa. And so it was important for them. Uh, Wait, they're only one? Only one. And so they, you know, if not counting, you know, a warm water part, so we're not talking about Black Sea or anything else, but there's been nothing else that, um, you know, it was really an important area for them and the only place where they had that kind of naval foothold. It was important also because it was a listening outpost. So they had all their surveillance apparatus based there. And so when when Syria's civil war broke out, it looked like the government might fall. 
they were determined that that wasn't going to happen because that was bad news for the Russians. So the Russians, really, the reason that Assad stayed in power is the Russians and the Iranians together decided that no matter what you know, the rebels threw up against the government, we're going to put up that much more and make sure that Assad survives. Now, why does why did the Iranians like Assad? That's another thing we're going to talk about today, a lot of Iran. But what, why did the Iranians like him so much? Yeah. So the Iranians don't have many friends in the world, believe it or not. <laughs> but Syria is one of them. So Syria has been a very close ally for a long time. And strategically, it's an important ally because... Uh, if you again look at the map, you can see you can go from Iran through Iraq. Uh, if you want to get to Lebanon to the coast, Syria is kind of in the way and are on the way. Mm. So they've essentially tried to create create a land bridge that goes all the way from Tehran, yeah, but you know through Iraq, which they now essentially control. It's it's another kind of sad artifact of what, what we're seeing going on right now. But but they're they control the parliament. There's they're, they 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 are the kind of the the dominant power in the region. And now they control Syria, so they have. There's nothing really that interferes with their ability to to move weapons and whatever they want mm. to the Mediterranean, to the to the ports of of Lebanon, and that's that's how they're able to to arm the the Hez, Hezbollah, which is a big militia that's based in in Lebanon. They can directly support them, not just by air but by land now. I got to give a huge shout out to my man, Bedros Koulian, for adding a great part to my daily routine every day. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, first of all, Bedros is a guy who has a huge YouTube channel. He's got an amazing story, came from a communist country, came to America, built a big business, was very successful, lived the American dream, and now inspires many other people to do the same. But one of his latest ventures is called Trulene. And Bedros turned me on to his product right here called Everyday Wellness. And let me tell you something, this thing is a hack. Essentially, it is a packet just like this. You stick it in a little glass of water, you put it in the water, you mix it up, it tastes like orange soda, and it's got all the necessary ingredients to not only help your immune system, not only help your digestion, but make you feel better and actually give you a boost to your day. I mean, I like taking it about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, so it's like a nice pick-me-up, but that's because this thing has vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, turmeric, all these amazing ingredients that you're probably trying to get in supplements all in one shot. I love it. You're going to love it too. And if you don't believe me, go check it out because these guys have a 30-day money-back guarantee. All you got to do is go to trulean.com and use the code Julian. 50 at checkout. That's all caps, J-U-L-I-A-N 50 at checkout for 50% off your first order within a subscription and 20% thereafter. You are not going to regret checking out this product. I'm really excited about this one because this is something I now use every day and I'd love to make these guys a part of the show moving forward because you guys are getting a lot out of it as well. So go to trulean.com and use the code Julian50 at checkout for 50% off your first order on your Trulean subscription right now right uh, i'm trying to look though they don't share the, y- no. yeah there's no shared border no so. shared border of the ron so they do have to go across iraq and that oh, would have nice. been a problem you know during the u.s occupation but now it's uh you know it's wide completely open. A, wide open for them because they because wow. if if you kind of look at where their militias are based now they're the oldest militia is is southern lebanon so it's hezbollah the Shiite militia yes. that, that's based there. Now Syria, except for government-controlled areas, there are all these um, Syrian militias that are pro-Iran that are all across the south. Um, and then you've got the the Iraqis uh, who have become such a client state of the Iranians to to a large degree. So it's essentially it's Iran Wait, is now Iraqis patrol. are our client state. Yeah, yeah, because they've they've been able little by little to take over ministries of government, like Ministry of Transportation. Um, these are wholly owned by Iran now, and and um, and we find our the few U.S. troops that are still in Iraq are constantly harassed by these pro-Iran militias that occasionally lob rockets into the bases where our folks are, or drones. It's a it's a constant harassment thing, and the Iraqis can't do anything about it. They, they're on on. The, the, the militias have become so powerful that they're almost as big in, in terms of numbers Whoa. and armament as the, as the armed forces of Iraq. So it's, it's a complete game changer for, for, the, for the Iraqis right now. Am I remembering correctly here? Like Iran is Shiite, mm-hmm. right? And Iraq under Saddam was Sunni, yep. the Ba'ath Party. And then when they got rid of Saddam, 
like all the way to today now, is it more Shiite running Iraq? Yeah, because the interesting thing about Iraq, even though the government historically was Sunni, it's majority Shiite. So there are actually many more Shiites in, in Iran. And they felt during the, the Saddam Hussein era, they felt persecuted and felt um, like a um, persecuted minority. But even though they have majority of the population, now they've come back in a big way. Right, they control right, the right. government. And so the, the, the tables are completely turned. And it's the Shiites, which Iran is, that control the country now. And they're the, um, the leaders of many of the Shiite parties are, are pro-Iranian very directly. Okay. So are there like meetings, by the way, like these days, like with Assad and – Oh yeah, the Ayatollah and yeah. stuff. Yeah, and we we see that like all the a G seven summit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you know, there's always they always look exactly the same. It's the Syrians who wear Western dress. They wear suits and ties, and you'll see Assad hanging out with the Ayatollah or with uh, with the leaders of the of the Revolutionary Guard Corps. And it's uh, it's a very cozy relationship. And and it's if anything, it's just gotten stronger because Syria would not exist right now as a you know at least the regime would not exist if not for the Iranians backing them up. But is Assad how secular is Assad these days? Because, like, I would think Ayatollah would look at him and say, heathen, or, yeah, you know, yeah. whatever. But I guess, you know, yeah. what's, be, what's be, fair is love and war. Right. And the fact that the Assad family is just, it, they're not really Shia or Sunni. There is this really strange little sect that's called the Alawites. And they're mm. kind of Shia, but most Shiites would consider them to be heretics or um, not good Shiites in any case. So there's always been this sort of awkward, um, you know, relationship in terms of their religion, but because it is sort of a Shiite uh, faith, they, you know, they've they've managed to click. And and in any case, Assad looks to the Iranians as as their salvation. Mm. So um, they've been able to put whatever religious differences behind them. And you're right, uh, Assad's not really a, a religious guy. He's not. There's nothing Doesn't about him. No, that. he's not. Not in his behavior, and also not not, not in his uh, you know his practice. There's no evidence of of him being very very pious at all. Now I'd asked you about the history of the Russia relationship with them, and I just realized that was a dumb question because they were the guys. Russia are the ones who got Ellie Cohen. Yep. Who like caught Ellie Cohen was the famous Israeli undercover spy in Syria. I guess they caught him in like 1965. Yeah. And they used their Russian, like there was some sort of tracking technology that the Syrians brought in the Russians and they helped them. So I guess that's been around like, yeah, since that's early Cold War. Nice Netflix. I think it was Netflix. Nice yes. little, little series. Really Excellent show. Yeah. The Spy. Yeah. With yeah. Sasha Baron Cohen. Yeah. Really, really good. And the reward for that for the Russians is um, there aren't too many Mediterranean ports where they can go and hang out. And, yep. and in the 60s and 70s, Russian generals would retire and, and build villas down there. <laughs> so you've got you know, a pretty big uh, Russian expat community, uh, even from that time. Like now? Yeah, you can still run into them. And Like, um, can you vacation? <laughs> <laughs> go hang out with Boris, yeah. In fact, the... Um, you know, the, the start of the book, Red Line, is is about a, you know, there's, you know, this, the Russians are helping the, the Syrians develop a chemical weapons program, and there's a crazy Russian general who keeps coming back and forth mm. and, and uh, providing help. Uh, in one case, it took a whole train load of, of lab material to, to bring to the to the Syrians to help them out. So they've they've been there for uh, you know for decades to try to help the Syrians, but also kind of help themselves to to a luxurious lifestyle. Is there maybe forget Americans for a second? Let's go with like Brits. Is there a safe place, a safe whatever in any way for like a British person to be like, oh, I'm I'm gonna go visit Syria? Like, yeah. Can you do that right now? Probably not recommended. Um, <laughs> if you're if you're American, you're not going to get in because it's unless yeah. you've got dual citizenship, and that's even more dangerous if you've got like a Syrian passport. That's just bad news to go to Syria right now. Mm. So I've personally, I can't get into Syria proper. I can go across the border on the south or the north because it's a little bit fluid, and there's refugee camps, things like that. A legal immigrant, there you legal go. immigrant, right? Uh, but you cannot. Um, you know, they won't give you a visa, and mm. we've we've uh, as journalists, you know, we'll often try, but sometimes we'll have to get somebody with a Turkish passport or someone who seems like to be safe to get in. And it's a shame, actually, because you know what's left of the country after these this you know thirteen years of fighting, some beautiful places. Aleppo, is, Aleppo is one of the oldest cities in the world. It really got this, the crap kicked out of it during the civil war, but there's still nice areas. Damascus is is almost unscathed. It was a some attacks on the suburbs, the horrible chemical attack that took place in 2013 in the suburbs, but the most of the buildings and the infrastructure is is intact and it's wow. it's, it's quite beautiful in places and um that's so sad like you can't it can't be enjoyed by yeah. 
many people. Yeah, we. Uh, my my father was was, was a minister, and and uh, when he was when I was a kid, he went to the Holy Land and went to Damascus. And there was mm. a scene in the in the New Testament, which uh, any kid that went to to Bible school would know about this Paul's uh, vision from Christ yes. on the road to Damascus, and that's where that happened outside the gates of Damascus. So all those stories from there, and and they welcomed the Americans back in the in those days. Um, and not, but not now. And, and you wouldn't want to go just because it's, it's, it's pretty dangerous in many areas of the country. Mm. It's not, not a good place to tour. That's such a shame. Well, this is the book we've started to talk about. We're really going to dig into it now. It's called Red Line. I'm holding it up to the camera, but phenomenal book. I have read this one and this came out what beginning of 2021? Yeah, something like that. The, the worst possible time to try to <laughs> put oh, out a yeah, nonfiction like the book. January sixth, right happened. after it was February of, of, of 2021. So you you could not map out like a worse time to come out with a book because uh, it was it was it was a pretty bad COVID wave that winter. Uh, January sixth, had just happened, and trying to get like any show in any you know, TV show to talk about Syria was just impossible. All right. Well, we got one now. Oh, right. So we're, we're doing it. And we are going to talk all about Yemen today. You are very familiar with all the history there, which a lot of people don't know about. And I'm very misinformed on probably. And then we're also going to talk about Iran, as I said. But this book coincides. It's called Red Line because of the line I'm sure you'll talk about with Obama and what he said here. And essentially, it covers the chemical sarin gas attacks that Assad allegedly did upon his own people and the aftermath of the UN working with, I guess, various governments to try to clean this up. Yeah. So would you mind just starting from the beginning and explaining why those attacks happened, when they did, and also maybe we'll get into some of the people who try to say like, oh, this was the CIA that did that and yeah. stuff. I, I I know there's there's cases that are made there, but you looked into that and that was not what you found yeah. in this book. Yeah. So, I mean, one way to, to start describing this is that most Americans aren't aware of the fact that we, we really dodged a bullet in Syria in 2013, which is because Syria had a weapon of mass destruction. It didn't have a nuclear weapon. It wanted to get one, but since it couldn't, it developed one of the most sophisticated and largest chemical arsenals, chemical wepo weapons mm. arsenals in the world. And it consisted mostly of nerve agents like sarin and VX, stuff that, you know, just a couple of drops will kill you. And what so, is it? It shuts down your your. It shuts your down your nervous system. Mm. So that, since your your nerve system goes haywire, so your nerves can't communicate with each other. So your brain, your heart, everything shuts down, and it can be deaths in in, in seconds in some cases. Mm. But it's a terrible way to die. It's fast, but it but it's also just excruciatingly painful. But that was Assad's big weapon, and he spent a lot of time putting it together. In the book, we talk about how he did it in the early days and who helped him. And there was this crazy American chemist who shows up in the middle of it, or American trained chemist who actually really likes America and becomes a spy for the CIA right in the middle of their chemical weapons program. Mm. But um, when when civil war started in Syria and when the regime has its back against the wall, when it looks like Syria may actually fall, Syria starts to look around for how how to stop the rebels. Like 2011, 2012? Yeah, 2011, 2012. Really, by late 2012 and 2013, they're okay. deciding that we have to use everything we got, and that includes the chemical weapons we have. We, they made chemical weapons because they were going to use them against Israel, in theory. That war never happened, but instead they decided, we'll just use it against our own people. What was their beef with Israel? <laughs> so they've been in, what, three wars with, with Israel historically. It's, right. The big ones were 67 and 73, when, frankly, they got their butts kicked pretty badly. Right. And in each case, you get like uh, Russia, you know, Israeli tanks coming across the border and, and killing Syrians. And so they, Syrians hate the Israelis, and it's complicated. <laughs> there are all kinds of reasons why they do, but they really still remember those wars. Mm. And so there's a, there's, there's a deep animosity that exists. And part of their, I guess, their, 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 their ability to feel secure about their border with Israel is that they, they knew that Israel knew that they have chemical weapons. So if there's some kind of exchange, now we've got these sarin shells that we can lob into Tel Aviv or something like that. Mm. But civil war breaks out. Uh, they use them against their own people. That's been documented something like 70 times altogether. That includes chlorine gas and some things that are not nerve agents. But you said they wanted to use it against rebels, but they ended up using it against like regular Syrian civilians? In, in rebel neighborhoods. So in 2013, uh. when 
probably things that are the darkest for the for the regime. You've got rebels so close that they're in the suburbs. They're close enough they can they can fire mortar shells in the downtown Damascus. So that's pretty dire. So this operation gets started to try to clear out the the rebel areas, including um, suburbs where just like apartment buildings and and uh, homes where ordinary people live. But these are rebel areas. And so they, part of their clearing campaign was to fire a bunch of uh, of sarin shells into neighborhoods, mm. and particularly on one day in tw- in August of 2013. Thing is about sarin; it's it's heavier than air. It's it's a it's it's a heavy gas. Please try again. And <laughs> and, uh, and and Syria doesn't like it. Um, but the the gas because it's heavy goes into underground areas, goes into basements, goes into bomb shelters, and that's mm. where all these families were seeking shelter from the, the Syrian bombardment that had been going on for days. How does it die off? Like like when we talk about nuclear bombs, for example, and the radiation blast, right? There's a certain number of miles, and as it gets farther and farther, it gets less and less. Yeah. Is there, you said like a couple drops of sarin can kill you. Like, yeah. how does it stop? Like it's gas, doesn't right. it just spread? So it, it spreads for a while, it eventually degrades. And, and the interesting thing about some of these nerve agents is that water mm. degrades them. And so they don't last very long in, in the environment. That's why the the munitions are made to spray them, to, to, to disperse them as a, as a fog, an aerosol. So if you get anywhere close to that, that's lethal. There's another variation called VX, which is kind of like sarin, but it's it's oily, and so it sticks around longer. And the, the Americans and the Russians back in the Cold War days developed VX so it would stick to surfaces mm. like tanks or you know, r- you know artillery, so even days later, if somebody touches it, they could get a fatal dose. And the Syrians were making that too. Scary how many things out there. Like we are so delicate yeah. in the world. Like yeah. it, it blows my mind that, you know, this kind of stuff doesn't happen all the time because, you know, half the places that have it are, are kind of wreaking havoc type countries yeah. too. Yeah. But this, the scary thing about that is it's harder to control an arsenal in a place like that. And that mm. was part of the problem in, in the civil war in Syria they had all these weapons and the country was falling apart. And the big scary freak out moment for the Americans and the rest of the world was, what happens if the government loses control of all this sarin and there's all these extremist groups in the country, they could just back up a truck That's right. and haul the stuff away and you know, blow up something in, in Europe or, or take it to North America. That's the part that really spooked people the most. Um, where was their base for all this stuff? Like where were they keeping it and how were they storing it? So yeah, they were pretty, pretty good in their engineering. So they had a network of about 22 major facilities across the country. Some were like underground bunkers built into sides of mountains. So they were, you know, pretty hardened against outside attack. Other places, it was like uh, air, airport hangars where they just kept the bombs stacked up. But they had accumulated a lot of it in the liquid form in big tanks so, uh, with the idea that if you kind of mix two ingredients like peanut butter and jelly mm. at the very last minute and that turns it into sarin, said everything was ready to go except for the final mixing. And so a lot of the places where they stored things were just big vats of chemicals. Sometimes you know, I've seen pictures of these and just row after row of huge, you know, you know, barrels of, of, of really, really nasty stuff that they were ready to use in a moment's notice. Can we pull that up, Alessi? Syrian barrels of sarin it's, gas? It's, you probably See what that yeah, looks like. You might find some from my book because there's. Uh, they might I, be on there? Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. You might have. I got some of those little tankers in there. Um, right. That's that shit's crazy. So they were doing. Someone's backing up outside, by the way. Sorry. But so they were. How long? Like, do we know the year they started? building this approximately and the second question is when obama gave his red line line which maybe you can explain some color there too was that they hadn't used it before at that point but we were basically announcing to the world that we knew they had it yeah yeah so so they'd had it since the 80s and again the way the book starts out is this american trained chemist who was put in charge of making sarin and he invented a unique formula for it that was different from anything that exists in the world. The Russians can make it, the Americans can make it. He made a different kind. And that becomes important later on because when they recover samples of the sarin that was used in the attacks, they're able to line it up exactly with, with the kind of, with the formula that the Syrians had. Mm. But so they started making it really good quality sarin in the 80s. And by 2000, they had factories making this stuff. So they were making it in large quantities. They had big reserve stocks. It was a serious weapon of mass destruction program. And that's 
sort of the state of things in 2011 when the civil war started. And then you quickly get into a problem where the government, the Syrian government, is losing control of big chunks of the country, including areas where this stuff was kept. And that's when all the alarm lights start going off. And so when does Obama come in and how did that go down? So Obama comes in in 2012, the first time, there's the famous red line um, remark that he makes. Can and we pull that up, Alessi? Obama red line Syria remark? We might be able to play it, but go you'll, ahead. You'll, you'll get that because that's that's uh, it was actually at a press conference. I think it was Chuck Todd that asked a question at the end of a news conference, which was about something else completely. But uh, Obama and Hillary Clinton both had been sending little warnings to the Syrians <laughs> publicly, but also privately. There's been only some private conversations as well because they were getting intel from our intelligence community, but also from the neighbors, from Israel and, and others, that Syria was starting to move these chemicals around. And that started getting people really nervous. And we can hear a little of that if you want. Yeah, let's get the, let's hit this one. Turn that volume on. It's off on YouTube, sorry. Yep, yep, good. We have been very clear to the Assad regime, but also to other players on the ground that a red line for us is we start seeing a whole bunch of chemical weapons moving around or being utilized. First of all, I didn't set a red line. The world set a red line. Ooh. All right, that was cold. Yeah. Yeah, and that that's, that's interesting. So at the time... Again, this wasn't a, a communique coming out of the White House with that goal that we thought about this. The president's responding to a question and he uses That's a right. colloquialism, which is red line, which is to say that we see what you're doing, Syria. Don't go there because bad things will happen. He didn't say exactly what. Everybody assumed it in the military force. But it was a message that was being delivered because, as I said, intel communities were watching very closely what the Syrians were doing. And they saw things, saw chemical weapons coming out of their bunkers. Mm. That meant either that Syria was planning to use them or the scarier scenario was that Syria was about to give them away. So if the government thought it was going to collapse, why not give this arsenal to Hezbollah, the, the militia group next door in, in Lebanon that's really close friends? And the Israelis started thinking about the possibility of, of attacks from Hezbollah that now include sarin gas Ooh. instead of just rockets. That could wipe out whole towns and villages if that oh, started for sure. And so you have this moment, and, and nobody was really talking about it. These like cryptic words that the president used, we talked about if we see Syrians or anybody else using, starting to use these weapons or move them around, he was sending a very clear, if somewhat subtle from our ears, message to the Syrians that you can't do this. Guys, if you're still watching this video and you haven't yet hit that subscribe button, please take two seconds and go hit it right now. Thank you. And, and I can tell you just from hours and hours of interviews with people who were working this issue at the time, they were freaking out about the possibility that something very bad was going to happen with these Syrian weapons. And so this is like the president using the, the kind of toughest language he can from the pulpit, you know, the White House saying, please don't use these or you're gonna, we're going to mess with you in a big way. Which, and, yeah. yeah. Which came back to haunt him later because when Syria did use chemical weapons against its own people... Obama's first impulse was to launch missiles, That's and he right. was all set to do that. The ships are in the Mediterranean. It's a very complicated story about why the, the missiles weren't launched. It's not just because he didn't want to, and we can go into that later, but it was a decision was made about getting involved in a, in a Syrian conflict that we did not want to get involved in. Well, actually, I think that was a huge revelation in your book because a huge, huge criticism I have of Obama's presidency is in particularly his second term foreign policy. It was... Mm -hmm putrid, to mm. be honest with you. But I was unaware of this history right here. So he obviously makes a big mistake on an off-hand remark yeah. with this and sets a sets what I'll call a pride line. Yep. Because now if it's cross, he feels a sense of pride to have to take care of it. But he's a president who had run on trying to get rid of these wars in the Middle East, not start new ones, following up the George W. Bush presidency. And here he was, once that red line gets crossed... His impulse, as you laid out, was to launch a missile attack. And you're going to have to correct me if I'm wrong in my interpretation of this at the end. But the way I understood it from your book is that he – that was not a declaration of war. He had the right as the executive of president to declare that attack. Yeah. But last minute, in an effort to check himself, which I do appreciate, he said, fuck it, send it to Congress – let them vote on it, which he did not have to do, but he did that. And he actually did think like they were going to vote for him, but they voted like 400 to 100 against yep. and they didn't do it. And so I say I respect this because 
He didn't let his pride get in the way of starting what would have absolutely turned into a war. It would have been a formality at that point. And I think about where it was on the timeline. This is the year before ISIS really becomes a thing. Imagine if we had had a war in Syria already yeah. when ISIS goes down. Yeah. I mean, it would have been a disaster. So this is actually one thing in his foreign policy that I'll give him some credit for. I, I think that wasn't too bad. But yeah. is that a fair interpretation? It absolutely is. And I, 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 I really like your ability, which so few people have these days, is, is to look at things just just straight up. You know, what were the decision factors and, and did the person make the right decision or not? And in, and if you can put politics out of it, you know, for whatever your political beliefs are, you just kind of look rationally at, well, if this was my decision and here's the inputs, here's, here's what I'm thinking about, what call do I make? And it, first of all, you have to at least recognize this is really, really complicated stuff. Because the easy thing is to say, well, sure, you should have just bombed the crap out of them. The reality is you're, you're not going to destroy all the chemical weapons. You're in, and then what if he continues to use them? Then what, what do you do? So these guys in the, in, the, in, the national, in the White House situation room are gaming out all these things that could happen and how many things could go wrong. And, and, and so they're trying to think carefully about this. And you're right. The president uh, had been – a big supporter of the fact that con that presidents should go to Congress if they're going to go to war, which is just sort of unilaterally, you know, launch campaigns. And so he, some people thought it was a cop out, but he did go to Congress and say, "How about this? Let's all do this together as a country. Let's unite behind this if we're going to do it." Congress, bipartisan, bipartisan yeah. uh, agreement, wanted nothing to do with it. Right. They didn't even want a, a little slap on the wrist with with Assad. They didn't want anything at all. And, and so the, the, the White House had to kind of withdraw the idea of, of a congressional approval because there was zero support for it. And that was embarrassing for the president. It was kind of put him in a box because now he threatened a red line. And not only was he having to eat his words, but he had the humiliation of, of Congress right. backing him. So it was a real low point for the president. But it was also I, – I think that was at least putting – it appeared to me like it was actually for a second – trying to put the country before his pride because yeah. he he had fucked up already yeah it, it was what it was like now he's got to step in his shit yeah and he did and there's a lot of guys who would have been like hit the button yep you know so that was that wasn't too bad i guess but there was like a whole you, you really painted this full picture backstory that i had no idea about in this book about the whole operation to get rid of it yeah and to get it out of there so how, how again did the UN? I read the book about a year ago, so some of it's a little hazy. But how again did the did the UN get access to Syria? Did Assad like technically let them in, or did they forcibly come in? Like what, what went down? Yeah. So when Assad used this, these weapons, I, it, it it looks clear in hindsight that the Syrian army had no idea what they had just done. They they thought they were, they'd launched some chemical weapons. They didn't realize that thirteen hundred people were going to die because mm. of it. So you have the next day you've got. These horrific images all over, you know, cable news throughout the world of this massacre, and it's all kids and women because they're the ones in the bomb shelters, and they're the ones who got killed for the most part. And so, um, Russia, being Assad's big backer and sponsor, just got on Assad's ass and said, "This, this is we can't have this. You just embarrassed us in front of the world. You said you didn't have any chemical weapons at all, and now we all look like idiots." So they forced the the Syrian government to cut a deal. And mm. the deal was, you as your as your price for being idiots here, you have to eliminate your entire program. You have to unilaterally give up all the chemical weapons you have, and that's a, that's a one sided give up because the, Syri the rebels don't have to give up anything. Syria has to give up its most important, most expensive weapons program as the whole world watched, and and it was because of Russia's embarrassment that basically a, a deal was brokered that the UN could come in and, and help Syria destroy these weapons. Do we know that they – do we know for a fact that they gave up every location they had? They didn't, and they didn't from the very beginning. So in the very first <laughs> kind of declarations, the Syrians were asked, okay, well, we've got to list all the places where they are and tell us, well, you know, what you know, condition they're in. And it was all a bunch of lies in the beginning. But we called them on it because, remember, we had a, a spy inside Syria's chemical weapons program mm. up until – 2004, when he screwed up and and, uh, and and got caught being a spy and was executed. But up until then, oh, he was executed. he was executed. Yeah, he was essentially he was arrested because uh, of of a corruption suspicion. But he thought he was being arrested because the Syrians discovered he was spying for the CIA, so he admitted to the to the wrong crime. And of course, he was taken out and shot almost Ooh. right away. 
But up until that moment, the, these uh, you know we had we had really good in, intel on exactly what they had and where it was, and so they started to give us some crap. We just said, oh no no no, here's the satellite pictures, <laughs> here's where your stuff is, and you better give it up, or or we're gonna we're gonna reconsider this whole airstrike thing. Uh. And so they were forced to, to give up most of what they had, but they still didn't do it all. They hid some of it away. They kind of fudged their records, and so we didn't get everything. So there's still some there today. We got about 90, 95 percent. That's what the CIA thinks. But that's still that's, a dangerous. That's, that's a massive amount of material. Yeah. And of course, the other big issue is okay, so. <laughs> You've got all these chemical weapons. How in the world do you get them out of a country that's in the middle of a civil war? This was amazing. Yeah. This whole thing. And then what do you do when you get them out? I mean, who's who's going to take 1,300 tons of liquid chemical weapons? We're not. The Americans aren't going to take it. Russia didn't want to take it. And so you're stuck with this thing that, okay, well, we can get them out, but what are we going to do with them? And so there's a whole you know, like kind of meltdown over, over physically how you destroy a, a stockpile of this size without anybody getting killed. Can you explain how they did this? Because this was this was amazing. They yeah. built like this they built- <laughs> ship specially for it and was emanating from America. Yeah. I forget, the, the place was in Maryland, is it's, that right? It was in actually in Virginia down in, in the Portsmouth, Norfolk area. But and basically, who was that guy? So, what yeah, was this? Yeah, it's a crazy, crazy story. And it, it only happens, you know, it, you know, it sounds like a movie, but basically they had this one kind of cranky old guy in the army <laughs> whose job, that was his entire career, was was cleaning up chemical weapons and usually finding old stockpiles around the world and his 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 and his team their job was to kind of make these things go away and so they came to they came to this guy his name was Tim Blades he's still working down in Maryland and said what's the best way to get rid of this stuff and his little back of an envelope sketch becomes a floating chemical weapons destruction factory <laughs> that was built from scratch on an old cargo ship and then sent out to the middle of the Mediterranean. And the plan was when they sim- when those weapons finally come out, they're going to go on this boat, and Tim Blades and his crew are going to make them go away and just destroy them. And they they didn't have a great plan, as it turned out. <laughs> <laughs> it worked just barely, but it also almost capsized the ship because they yeah. they almost ran out of of, of uh, fuel, and the ship was becoming top heavy and had all these. Can you explain how it worked though? Because like all I kept thinking about, and maybe I was thinking about this wrong, but I'm like. This is so close to an environmental disaster, <laughs> right? Like, I don't know how gas would behave. You said water destroys it, so maybe not, I guess, if it's in the middle of the Mediterranean. But, you know, there you got a whole crew of people and you got enough gas to kill a whole country yeah, yeah. on board. But they, how did they build this thing? Yeah, so water is a key, but it's a very complicated process. You basically have to take take the chemicals and then pressure uh, push a bunch of water and water molecules blend with it. It's, it's a fairly technical comp- um, mechanical process. But but you're right about the environmental concerns. Um, all of Southern Europe, when it, the word gets out that the Americans have this most big ship of you know floating chemical weapons, you know, right off the coast of Greece and Italy, people went bananas. They sent like uh, flotillas of activists out to chase the ship and try to stop <laughs> them, and and um, and everybody was worried that this stuff is going to, oh, you know, the place was going to you know capsize and all these fish would be killed and God knows what else and every, dead things wash in on beaches, and it, it didn't happen, but it happened almost. In the fact that it succeeded was was just almost accidental. I mean, these guys knew what they were doing, but nobody had ever done anything like this before on this scale on a boat in the middle of the Mediterranean. As if you think about, did they have to pick like where specifically? Yeah, then, so they, they like, picked were there a, countries that were upset it was in their area. Was, yeah, it had to be kind of international waters and far enough off sea so nobody could really monitor them. And so they had like this little rectangle of space in the middle of the Mediterranean. They just basically did laps around it for forty two days while the while the chemicals were being destroyed, and it just. You know, say it, it. It was that the idea was great, and the guys who did it were just unbelievably brave. But because no one had ever done it before, and because it's crazy to try to do it on a boat that rocks and that there's waves and winds, and, and you know nothing is stable on a boat, and so, so it's the worst possible place to try to pull off something like this. And they managed to just succeed. They got the last barrel destroyed as they were running out of fuel. And if they'd run out of fuel because that's ballast in the ship. The ship could have capsized, and they were doing programs. They checked the programs later about their the boat stability. It should have capsized in the last week mm. of operation, and it didn't. That's crazy, man. So how it was forty two days where they're going around in a circle, and this is in like twenty fourteen. So it's August like of of twenty fourteen, where it's like crazy hot in the Mediterranean. These guys are working in you know full hazard suits, 
24 hours, like 12 hour shifts and day and night just sweating their, their nuts off and, and not getting much sleep and, and, you know, just, just working on kind of destroy this, this, uh, this stockpile one barrel at a time. Mm. And the guys who were, who did it just, it's one of the most difficult things that any of them have ever done. And they're completely anonymous. Nobody knows who they are. Um, it, nobody had heard of templates outside, you know, a few departments in the Pentagon. And he was absolutely a hero. I mean, he came up with a pretty bold plan, talked people into it, and just had the sort of the, the balls to get on this boat and do it himself. He was there, you know, wiping wiping spills off the deck himself with his own handkerchief. You know, it was that kind mm -hmm. of guy who just had to make sure he was on top of every every detail what it was going on. And you talked to him. For this Spent book. a lot of time. Yeah. Went on the boat with him. Um, oh, that's cool. Yeah, what, what, the captain who piloted the ship came back for a little reunion, and so we all got to spend like three days just talking about just every detail of how this thing came together and how wow. how improbable it was. And nobody at the Pentagon wanted to do this. Nobody thought it was a good idea to put chemical weapons on a boat and try to destroy them. And in the end, it was the only plan they had. It's the only thing, it could, only thing they could come up with to get rid of them. And once they did this, what happened? So they, they're allowed to, there was the deal brokered, like you said, where Russia forced Assad to say, yes, you can come do this. They take it out. They get it on this boat. They destroy it. They think they got ninety five percent of it. Whatever they got. What was the immediate aftermath in the relationship with Assad? Was there any type of attempted at diplomacy between him and the United States, or has it had been has it been completely ice cold and no communication since then? It started to sour about halfway through this program. The Syrians played real nice in the beginning, and we, are, we always wanted to get rid of these things anyway, so <laughs> thanks for helping us out. And then, uh, but then as they started going along, the Syrians just started like dragging their feet and making excuses and putting up obstacles. And by the end, there was just, everybody was furious at each other. But the one thing that kept it together is because uh, at that moment when they were getting rid of the last stockpiles of chemical weapons, the the Islamist groups, the terrorists, were starting to really be on the march and taking over whole areas of Syria that they hadn't had before. And the last stockpile of chemicals that existed in Syria was on an air base out in the desert that was surrounded at the time by by jihadists. Oh, and, that's and they, nice. They would have loved to have gotten their hands on I'll it. Bet. There's something like six thousand gallons of sarin precursor, oh. enough to fill a small swimming pool. You can imagine just a few drops kill somebody. How, what kind of damage you could do with something like that? Oh my! And God. it was literally the reason that the last um, shipments of this stuff had trouble getting out was because they had to run a gauntlet of of um, of, of terrorist groups that had surrounded the base completely and, 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 and blockaded it. They had to kind of fight their way out in order to get the stuff to, to the port. Now, I'm trying to remember exactly who has reported on this. I want to say Cy Hirsch is one of them, but there is the theory that CIA would have done this. Yeah. What I've never fully understood there is what their motive would have been. I Because the way I understand it is that they had – bigger fish to fry. Like if they were going to try to start some in the Middle East, they had way bigger fish to fry at the time than yeah. Syria. Yeah. The, so the, the conspiracy theory that's come up around this is that you know, anybody who wanted to see the Americans involved in this war, they would have a motive potentially sure. to try to do a, a false flag chemical weapons right. attack. So what if it was the CIA that, that launched those, those, those rockets and killed all those people? Um, that runs into trouble real quickly because a the CIA had wanted nothing to do with the war. They did not want to get involved. They did everything they could to avoid Americans getting involved. So they how do we know that? Well, I just you know from covering at the time and you know going to many meetings and drinks and lunches with guys who were running the program at the time, they didn't want to get. They just gotten out of Iraq. Mm. They, they, there's no benefit for for Americans getting involved in Syria. It was another quagmire. They just did not want to get involved with it. So the the fact that the idea that the CIA would want to sort of trigger something, it just doesn't make any sense. There are other people who could have, like say the rebels, for example, and that was the more credible theory that maybe the rebels got hold of some chemical weapons mm. and, and and launched this attack. Yes, And that seemed credible even to the UN inspectors who first came in to investigate the, this chemical attack in 2013. They thought, what? Well, maybe the, maybe the rebels had staged this. It, it took a, a pretty impressive forensic investigation to figure out. Well, no, the the rockets were fired from this location, and that's where the where the Syrian army was. It's not where the rebels were. That the rockets, the munitions that were used, the chemicals that were used, 
everything tracks back to the Syrian, Syrian regime. There's never been any evidence that the rebels ever got any significant quantities of, of, of sarin or anything else. So essentially, almost by process of elimination and by good forensic evidence, it all points to Syria itself. And there's little things too that kind of reinforce that belief, such as when the attack happened in 2013, there were intercepts of Syrian generals and army officers talking to each other about, whoops, we really screwed up. Did you see all the people who were killed from this? We're really going to be in trouble with the boss. So we have that kind of intelligence too. So all adds up pretty clear portrait uh, of, of a Syrian government trying to find some desperate means of fighting a war that they weren't winning. And then doing everything they could to try to walk away from it when, in fact, they've just committed one of the biggest you know, human rights atrocities in the last right. couple of decades. Were we ever able to get – and maybe if we did, they would have never given this publicly. But was there any sort of like smoking gun like memo or tied to the order to fire that we were able to get that you've talked to your sources about? If you're allowed to say. No, it, nothing in the sense of a, a, a command or order. So that would be nice if we had it, but it didn't, you know, to, we don't have that. What we do have is intercepts of discussions afterward, which just seem pretty convincing. But I think the most convincing thing is, as I said, Syria's sarin was different. It had different right. molecules, different chemicals. And years later, and in, se in several different investigations, Chemists from different countries have been able to look at the remains or the or the, uh, the residual uh, material from this chemical attack and from others and say, this is precisely serious formula. And it's not just something that resembles serious formula, but we could tell on an isotopic level, this is the stuff they made before 2005. Got it. So they, they, they had the pedigree because they, one of the things our spy did, we had this, this uh, Syrian chemist spy who was inside the program. He gave us samples. <laughs> so he was not only telling us where all the locations were. Hey, you guys want to try something? Yeah, he did. He, he met a CIA guy at his house and said, oh, you know, here, here's what You're we like made. You're like the Yeah. I'm sorry. It wasn't his Why house. Why give him an Italian accent? God damn it. <laughs> it, it was in a, it, actually in a car uh, near near his house. And he, he in, in the front seat of a car, handed over a vial containing some of the sarin that they'd made. Nice. So the, the CIA could take it back and analyze it. So we knew exactly what they were making. And later on, when they used it, it was it was a smoking gun in that sense. We had the formula and we knew this was theirs. Whoa. All right. So you're saying fast forward to today though, this has turned into like a, a narco state <laughs> or something. Like again, Mad Max Fury Road already out there since circa twenty eleven. Yeah. What who's bringing drugs in there? What kind of drugs? Is it terror linked as well, I assume? Like what's going on? So uh, there's a drug that's called Captagon that people don't know much about in this country, but it is the drug of choice in in the Middle East and particularly in the Gulf countries. It's Sounds the, fun. It's, it's the club drug. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's a speed. It's, um, but it's also, there's a, a very unique euphoria, I'm told. I haven't used oh, a lot you're, of Oh, I was going to say, you are speaking from <laughs> yeah. experience over here, it sounds I know this like. one. And they used to call it the, like the, the terrorist drug because it gives you, as if you take it, you have a sense of invincibility. And oh, so that's nice. And so then the knock on, like, um, well, yeah, you could give it to like, ISIS fighters, and they did. And these guys would, <laughs> would feel like they were, they were supermen, and they would go you know charging after tanks oh, and things because nobody could beat them. So this is the drug we're talking about. And um, Syria used to have, it used to be a fairly, you know, uh, you know middle-class country in the sense it had, had industry, it had a very uh, educated population, and a lot of pharmaceutical facilities. They made a lot of drugs there. But since 2013, they're not exporting many drugs or anything, any legitimate sure. products to the world. Their, their economy has completely collapsed. And so those pharmaceutical plants have switched to making <laughs> Captagon and a few other nice things. They make some crystal meth too. Oh, cool. And they make it in <laughs> massive quantities. And so you've got supply there right inside Syria itself, and you've got a distribu distribution network, which is all the proxy groups, Iranian-backed -back proxy groups from Lebanon to Syria to, to Iraq. They're all involved in it. They so it's all, like Hezbollah doing it's, this? It's Hezbollah's is involved. They, they, they get really mad when you, t when you accuse them of making it, but there's no question that people in the Hezbollah network are big movers of this stuff. And they've, they've been doing this historically since the 80s with cocaine in, in Latin America. Hezbollah yes. managed to get involved, to get its hands in all kinds of things like that. Yes. They, they find ways to make money, and sometimes you can do it through, through selling drugs. But Have now, you ever seen, I'm sorry to cut you off. Have you ever seen that Politico story that shows the 
that this came out probably like yeah. seven, eight years ago that shows the track of that and how they do it. Yeah. With like used cars getting it through West Africa and like piling cocaine in and then putting it through the through to Mexico. These guys are businessmen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, they may be kind of wacky in different ways, but they, they know how to make a profit and they know how to move things across borders illegally because that's how they've survived for decades now. So they're really good at this. And you know, my my last reporting trip in the Middle East, I was up on the Jordanian border with up against the Syrian border, and now Jordan, you know, a, a fairly stable country, is having to deal with armed convoys of these drug traffickers coming across the border, and sometimes three or four armored vehicles, 70, 80 people who are involved, terrorists. Terrorists. A lot of them are militia members, but these are guys trained, um, yeah. trained military people with. You know RPGs and machine guns and, and and small arms, and so when I'm up there, that these these Jordanians are telling me that any day when it's foggy, if you have bad weather, these guys are coming across. They've got a a, a border that's a couple of miles long, a, a couple hundred miles long. It's it's all desert, and so there are many many places where they could potentially pass. And the Jordanians are talking about their patrols being surprised on a foggy day with these guys coming out of nowhere and then shooting up uh, their own patrols, oh my God. killing people. And when it's when the weather's not crappy, when they can't move convoys, now it's drones. So drones come across the border. With drugs. With drugs. And, and drugs and weapons. Drug drugs. Yeah. And, um, it's, and I, I they, so they, they, they were very, uh, you know, eager since I was interested in showing me just some of the stuff they've gotten. And it was remarkable. Just... Thousands and thousands and thousands of tablets of Captagon. Just, just you know, you could just fill up the floor with with these bags. Didn't try stuff. any. Didn't try any. Wouldn't you let sure? me take any home. Okay. And then, and then, just the other weird stuff like like landmines, claymore mines, um, machine gun parts. Just, just all kinds of just weirdness coming across with these shipments heading to God knows where. So it's become it's not just a drug problem, but it's any kind of illicit contraband you can think of. That is now, the Captagon is the leading export of Syria today. The entire country, the leading, the export. leading export. This is the big money product that they have. I got to try this stuff. <laughs> yes, Sounds awesome. Must be good. <laughs> but, you know, because, you know, you always get like-minded people, you know, if, if there's money to be made, there are other people yes. come in, they're attracted to it. So there was a huge uh, bust, I think it was 2020 or 21, in, in southern yeah. Italy, where there was... Uh, of course there was. Calabrians yeah. or Sicilians? It was, I think it was Calabrians, yeah, but uh, don't shoot me. Um, and they- uh, Well, they're the big heroin guys. Yeah, and so they're, they're used sense. to this too. And they, they find really clever ways of hiding it. So in this particular case, it was a ship full of rolls of paper, like like newsprint paper. Oh, that's genius. And they just stuck it inside the inside the, the rolls. And ah, it was some massive amount, many tens of millions of dollars worth of stuff. And it just the, the, the Italians just happened to find it. But sometimes they'll put it inside- crates of pomegranates or you, you name the kind of a way to smuggle something. And um, it, it just, uh, yeah, here we go, $18 million worth of pills from Syria. I think it, that's the, that should be the one there. Biggest seizure of amphetamines in the world. Yeah, it's, so it's the one, one that starts Italy's right. biggest seizure. Yep. And I think one. you'll be able to see some of the... All right, from Rome. Italy reports biggest seizure of amphetamines in the world, one billion worth of pills, one billion dollars worth of pills from ISIS in so, Syria. So to correct that, so the only, the only thing that's wrong with that story is it's not from ISIS. People, ISIS became associated with this yeah, trade. Yeah, ISIS sells the headline, Joby, Th That is right, you know? it sells the headline. But, you know, the, the, they came from ports oh, uh, ports held by the, you yeah, know, there's, there's your little roll of paper. Yeah, go up, Alessi. Yeah, one, you know, hollow it out, and then this the crap just rolls out. Oh, just, my God. Ah, bins of stuff, and and so this is this is big business. So ISIS, you, there's no doubt that some of these other terrorist groups get involved and they they profit on it when they can. But this is a government-run enterprise. There are divisions of the Syrian army that have a piece of this and help run the factories. And we know this because we can see their vehicles moving in and out of the places where it's being made. But so, they're, I mean, they're bringing, they're obviously bringing this north, south, yeah, west, everywhere. all over. Yeah, and the biggest, um, biggest. Markets are actually Saudi Arabia, a place where you can't get a drink. But if you They'll go kill to, you yeah, for that, yeah. Right? But Captagon gets through, and it's one of these kind of like weird uh, drugs where it kind of it, it's not like heroin, you know, it's not addictive like that. And uh, and that Saudis don't like to talk about problems they have anyway. But it's it's rampant, and it's moving to other places in Jordan, for example, which is like it used to be just a transit country. Now it's it's a user country. And I know that from my own mm. reporting and talking to young people and say, yeah, yeah, you can't 
you can't go to a club without somebody offering you Captagon. It's right. everywhere. So this has become a really big deal. I've never heard of it. That's yeah, crazy. It was new to me too. And now it's now it seems to be everywhere. And the Europeans are seeing it start starting to creep up in the south in places like Greek, Greece. Oh, of and, course in Greece. Yeah, of yeah. Greece, yeah. But Duh. it's a it's it's a it's a good time party drug and they're and so you can and it's fairly cheap. And especially there's there's cheaper made versions of it that uh, sell for not much, so you, you can get high without a lot of money. Now, do they have, like, a lace fentanyl problem like we have here coming oh. from, like, the cartels or not so much? I've heard that it's more just really crappy product. So okay. it's, it's lace, but it's essentially cut and watered down, so it's uh, people get it and they're disappointed. Got but, it. Yeah. And am I also crazy to assume that Anything coming out of Syria like that, especially if you said it's starting with like the former pharmaceutical companies themselves, Assad's getting a cut of it. Yeah, because the, the Assad, they run the country, obviously, it's a dictatorship. But um, his family is is kind of entrenched in all the major industries, whatever is left there. So from, from telecoms, there's a, a sort of a, a cousin of Assad who runs the telecom business. And there's others that uh, that run the pharmaceutical companies that are left, and so if you if you got any successful business in Syria, you're you're connected either to the ruling family or to the army or or the intelligence services. Everything else is pretty much destroyed. What a crazy place, man! That is a wild history on Syria. So once again, everyone, make sure you get Redline. Great book explains all a lot of that at least in detail. But let, let's keep going across the Middle East here. Absolutely, we, we, we got some ground to cover. So. I had mentioned this early on, but one of the things a lot of people online are constantly like, wait, what is going on there? But I don't understand it, is what's happening in Yemen, or Yemen, I hear, as Dale Comstock said. Yeah. It wasn't like, you want me to go to Yemen, kill a few <laughs> terrorists, sign me up. It's like, I'm not going to Ukraine, but I'll go there. Yeah. But this, I guess Yemen used to be like a series of little kingdoms that came together into a country in maybe the 90s, something like that. But essentially... The way I understand it is you have this group, the Houthis, which is, you know, some sort of interpretation religious based who are backed by Iran and are trying to take control of the rest of the now combined country. And Saudi Arabia, who is who shares a border and has had problems with them, is like, no, no, no. Yeah. And they're having this proxy war that then the U.S. is somehow involved in. Sending in, you know, a few bombs, you know. Yep. Got to got to support the military industrial complex. But like, what's what's happening? Start, yeah. Let's start from the beginning. Let's actually get an educated take on it, unlike mine. <laughs> so, in this, a great rat ne rat's nest to get involved in. Yeah. It's needed needed another little shithole. I'm sorry, <laughs> not not to disparage <laughs> Yemen, but I'm just just in terms of its situation right that's now. That's what Dale it's, said it's pretty, too. Pretty so that's cool. And uh, I've been there, so I, it's. It's it's fascinating. It's a really wild place. I mean, there's it's it, the interior of the country is just amazing mountains and 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 you know high desert and beautiful in a very stark way and in the cities on the coast particularly sana it's uh the inner city is just tiny medieval windy streets but but not like you know medieval europe it's something I that's like right. st stone age you know winding streets just really st uh, a really unusual place but it's got this crazy complicated history there's actually a part of it that used to be a, a separate communist country that the, the chinese and the russians supported and then it's had civil wars and other countries like the egyptians have been involved in some of their fighting so it's 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 just been this crazy mess for a long time and out of this mess emerges this group called the Houthis. And the Houthis are, I mean, you almost have to think of them as being cult-like. They have their own little religion, which is kind of Shia, but kind of their own weird little thing. There's a, a ruling family, the Houthi family, which which uh, kind of leads this cult. Mm. They're, um, they've decided they really like the Iranians because the Iranians, uh, they, they see themselves as the Hezbollah of the South, that they essentially allied with with Iran and its interest and 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 the fight against the two big satans in the world which is Israel and the United States which they absolutely hate and they're just committed to destroying even though they have no way of doing that <laughs> um they they have this their their big chant whenever they have crowds together to you know they have to chant something and so it's like death to Israel death to the United States and and um destruction to Jews everywhere or something I'm I'm getting it all wrong but it's those, that's the essential message. They've hated us with a passion since the Iraq invasion. That's the thing that really set them mm. off. 
And so they they really do view the Americans as kind of the center of evil in the world. Didn't they have a leader though at the t- not the Houthis, but the country had a leader at the time that played like both sides against the middle? Yeah, right? yeah. And there was uh, they had their own Arab Spring moment too. And there was the 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 leader. I've actually I'd met him in uh, I think twenty twelve. Went over there. I was covering the State Department and went with the delegation. What was um, his name? Oh, you're gonna you're gonna stump me on that now. Oh, but boy. he was um, he ended up getting sick and and died. Um, but uh, he was beginning to have to deal with this this issue at the time of the Houthis kind of taking parts of the country and becoming a threat to the region. Because as we've mentioned, they, they don't like the Saudis, the Saudis don't like them. So a war broke out in which Saudis and the UAE together tried to fight the Houthis and ended up not really succeeding and, and, and sort of backing out of it. Um, the Americans supported the Saudis and the, the, the Emiratis with weapons and, and money, uh, mostly with weapons, selling them weapon systems. But it, the Saudis now look at it as as just a disaster. They don't want anything to do with fighting the Houthis anymore, even mm-hmm. though they're vastly bigger and 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 one of the wealthiest countries in in in, in the world. They they don't want to fight the Houthis because you just can't really fight them. As a friend was describing to me, he's like, you can't bomb these guys back to the Stone Ages because they're already in the Stone <laughs> Ages. So there's there's really almost no leverage against them. Mm. Uh, they they see an opportunity after the after the Gaza crisis. Uh, to fight the, their big enemies, Israel and America, and so they they, do, they they're just mostly sim- well, it's going to say mostly symbolically because they obviously can't do a lot of damage to us or to 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 the Israelis, but they can they can shut down shipping because they happen to be right there mm. in this little crossroads of the world where where much of the oil tanker traffic goes. Oh, was there a vi- Alessia? Can you go to YouTube real quick? I think there was a video recently from the Wall Street Journal. Type in Wall Street Dur- Journal most dangerous shipping port in the world. Just the thumbnail itself. I, this is this is on my watch later. I'm pretty sure it should have like maybe 648, 649 thousand views, somewhere in there. Do you see it? Yes, that one. It. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wall Street Journal explains. So we can't play it because it's Wall Street Journal. That little uh, straight there. This uh, is right now is one of the most dangerous places to, to to for shipping traffic in the world. The Gate of Tears. Yeah, and uh, it's because. The Houthis are there on, on that sort of east coast, but they've they've got because of their friendship with the, the Iranians, a remarkable array of weapons. And this is a country that, you know, one of the poorest countries in the region, if not the world. So it, it doesn't they don't have a lot. You know, people are poor, but the Iranians have given them some pretty impressive weapon systems. So they've got something like six kinds of anti ship missiles, Whoa. some some cruise missiles, all kinds of drones. Uh, a lot of these are Iranian either gifts from the Iranians or the Iranians have, have showed them how to make them, essentially help them create their own factories to make them. So they have a pretty robust armament industry, all of it, you know, aimed at being able to sort of take out boats um, and other things that they see as, as threats to them. Just today, and this is, we're doing this on the 22nd of March, they they launched a missile at uh, at Israel that actually apparently struck Israel, Israeli territory. And it didn't hit anything. It apparently landed in a desert area, and it'd be typical of the, of the Israelis. They're watching it come in. They see it's just gonna land harmlessly. Why do you waste a, a Patriot or, or or an Arab, you know, or an Arrow anti um, anti ballistic missile system, to, you know, by trying to take it down if it's just going to be landing harmlessly? But as far as I know, that's the first time that one of their missiles have actually hit Israeli territory. So how far? But that's far away. That is a that is a haul. But it's they're aiming at the southern port of Elad, which is just at the very southern tip of Israel. Um, okay, yeah. Let's but try it's, to pull it's up a still map here so we can understand. It, it's still a pretty impressive. Um, feet to be able to just to, to strike from there and it just shows you their capabilities so there's yeah a there's yemen. right there yeah and yeah. so that's not terribly far wait um, where's them. yemen yemen so the south tip of of the peninsula that's so pretty going, goddamn yeah, that's, far it, yeah that's but it's within range for them i guess it's uh, some of these that's these like, cruise missiles are a couple thousand mile um or a couple thousand kilometer range i was gonna say what's the relative you know top to top bottom tip to or bottom tip to top tip of saudi arabia that's a pretty long haul isn't is that it? like the east coast the, the almost i wonder zoom out for a second unless you so i can see america <laughs> that's a, figure it out. yeah yeah directions yeah that's right you know, see if you can walk from uh and a lot or Aqaba. See. So we can choose, right? So if we go 
to like right here? Duakaba, right there, yeah. Duakaba. Yeah, a lot's just right across the border from that. Okay. Right. Maybe let me change this direction. Let me start in. Do it from uh, Sana or. Sana. Um, yeah, yeah, that's their capital. Okay, wait. Sana to. Akaba. Akaba. All right, so zoom back out. All the names. And I think it'll, right. it'll show yeah, you. Yeah, very the... cool names over yeah. there. I think it'll show you all the Taco Bells on the route, too. <laughs> 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 McDonald's. <laughs> All right, my go. You got to go way up. Yeah, this is zoom out. That is far. Yeah, dude, this is <laughs> like. Yeah, now right. click Akaba. There it is. All right, it's loading. Twenty-seven hours, twenty-one hundred and seventy kilometers. Wow. Well, so that's what, like fifteen hundred miles. Yeah. So as the miles, as the like crow flies, it's probably under under 2000 so that's probably the range that's that's looking at the outer range of some of these systems and they have something powerful yeah. enough to get there thanks to the iranians they that's, have some really sophisticated drones that's too scary and that's why it's it's not a you know it's not an inconsiderable thing that they're they're flinging rockets and um and drones at at, at ship traffic and going through traffic going through and they actually have hit you know, a number but we've we're we've been pretty good at knocking a lot of those um missiles down Every now and then something sneaks through, but they just are, cannot be deterred. And that's the, 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 the weird thing about them. Any other country, like you, you know, they don't want to lose assets. They don't want to get their, their ports bombed. And we've been bombing the crap out of them almost on a biweekly basis. Right. And, and, and we they just, like America. We, we and, and the Brits are essentially doing it with us. I think the Danes got involved in one of these. The these Brits missions. have, whoa, this is a. Yeah, they've okay. been sending, you know, cut, sending planes down there with us, and we've been flying these routes together because we're just trying to bombing. make it, just trying to make it an international thing, going after mobile, <laughs> mobile. <laughs> international bombing coalition. Yeah, that's right. So, but, but essentially trying to, striking a, you know, uh, a blow for the, in the cause of shipping freedom or something like that. But to be, that the international shipping lane should be protected, and we're, going to enforce that idea uh, but, but they're we've, killing civilians also in the midst no trying real hard not to which is yeah, kind trying. of interesting and we don't know how many yemenis have been killed they've, they've admitted to a few but but often these strikes take place at times or in locations where it's it's not going to kill a lot of people and that's deliberate because we don't want to incite things even further because as i say you it doesn't you know these these little slaps don't don't seem to have an effect no. and we don't want to send troops over there believe me it's like the last little oh my god thing. No. yeah so so that's about the best we can do is just to kind of try to keep them uh from doing anything worse and and to, and to yank on the iranians chain as much as we can because the iranians have a lot of influence and control they don't absolutely tell the houthis what they can do and what they can't do but they have a lot of influence and so they could get them to back off if, if they really wanted to now like i know dale who dale comstock the guy I was talking about who's on the show he's X Delta Force Green Beret CIA Ground Branch, and he's one of the world's most recognized mercenaries now. We drove into an area that's about uh, seven kilometers that the Taliban owned. It was their territory. You can't make a left or right turn. You got to go north or south down this road. And we had to stop. We heard the Taliban on the radio. They had to set up ambushes on both of ends of our uh, small convoy, and they were getting ready to hit us. And then I realized, oh shit, the only way we're getting out of this is we got to run the gauntlet now. And I remember when we turned around that night, my Afghan interpreter was with me, dude. As soon as I started driving, I said, shoot anything where a bad guy can hide behind it, you know? I said, don't relent till we get out of this thing. So as I'm sitting there, I'm watching the vehicles go one by one, the firefight starts. I got time to watch the show and think about it before it's time for me to start driving my vehicle, right? And all of a sudden I thought, you know what? I've been in a lot of ambushes, but I've never actually had to deliberately drive into an ambush to get out of it, but I have no choice this time. And then I started thinking, man, what if I don't make it out of this one? You know, I am driving them with the antennas. And so I thought about my family and I took the moment. I said, okay, I want to visualize every one of my children's face, everybody's face, my wife, my kids, Kids, one by one, see their face for the last time, maybe their face, their face, their face, their face, their face. And then what I want to do is get that all out of my mind so I'm no longer distracted by that, right? And knowing that would be maybe the last time I ever think about him or see him. So I know he's done like some mercenary work mm -hmm. in Yemen, but do we have like intel slash paramilitary operatives on the ground there? If we do, that's it's a well kept secret. It wouldn't be impossible because we've actually done a lot of of uh, counterterrorism work inside Yemen, not in Houthi areas necessarily, but there, Al Qaeda used to have a pretty big presence there, and so we operated really? against Al Qaeda quite a lot. Um, when was that? So early to mid two thousands, and okay. they they the they they this is the headquarters of what's called um, Al Qaeda in the, in the Arabian Peninsula. So they're based in in Yemen, and they. 
they uh, were behind the, the remember the underwear bombing. I think that was yes. 2005 yes. when some guy was said a bomb in his underpants and That's he was right. trying to fly into Detroit on Christmas Day. So they had a part in that. They had this other um, big plot where they were trying to take uh, printer cartridges and put explosives inside them. They were going to blow up some cargo planes. So they had some pretty creative ideas that we managed to intercept and, and foil. But um, the Al-Qaeda presence there was a real big worry. And so for more than a decade, we've had a pretty robust special ops and agency presence in mostly, my sense was kind of more the northern areas of, of uh, Yemen where the, where the Sunni population is based, not so much in, in the... And, and the Houthi areas. Oh, but so all right. So we, yeah, we have that whole. I keep forgetting that we also have the Sunni Shiite thing going on. Yeah, again. yeah. That's that's a part of the you know the, the conflict whole Middle there. East. Yeah. yeah, and it, everywhere where there's the two groups that are, are side by side, unless they're controlled by a dictatorship or authoritative government, like they were in Iraq for for decades. Uh, they do seem to, to eventually get into blows. Guys, I have three other channels on YouTube where I am posting daily content from the podcast. They're called Julian Dory Clips, Best of JDP, and Julian Dory Daily. The links are in the description below. Please go subscribe. Thank you. What's the what's what's the main differences between Sunnis and Shiites? Oh, so it's like for yeah. the layman. Yeah, so it all has to do with which of these immediate descendants of the prophet, uh, which of his followers is the kind of the legitimate successor to the organization, essentially. And I don't want to get in trouble with, with Islamic scholars who know this history much more than I did. I'll but, defend but, it, but, don't but, worry. Yeah, but fairly early on, uh, the there was a split between uh, people who felt that this this one successor to to Muhammad was the was the the legitimate one, and then others who who had a you know completely different view of it and and and, and went with another one. It was something as as basic as that is who who the, who's the boss after the after Muhammad died, and it. Um, and then it sort of turned into centuries of of fighting and and, uh, and inter uh, you know inter tribal inter sect conflict, um, which continues to this day. And and there's there's they're very different belief systems now. I mean, some things they have in common, but there's um, you know who who the leaders are and what you know what rites they follow. It's it's it could be quite different. But the way they worship is it. Similar. C certain or? things are are similar, like the the praying to Mecca and the fasting okay. and things like that. But it's um, like the, the, the Iranians have this 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 uh, this view of uh, that they call them the Twelvers, the twelve uh, leaders of, of of Islam, and they've been, there's been eleven of them through history, and there's one more that's coming, and he's supposed to be a, a messianic figure. It's it's uh, hmm. I don't I must uh, not pretend to be an expert on this, but that's. Um, in in practice, they they have you know very different ceremonies and rites and you know customs than uh, than the Sunnis do. Are there communities in the Middle East where Sunnis and Shiites both live among each other and get along and are friends? And yeah, it used to be Iraq was kind of that way, and um, and then you'll see pockets elsewhere where the where the two um, two exist side by side. There's some of that in Syria. I've got a, a good colleague I work with who's. I think her father was Sunni, her mother, her mother was Shiite, and so she's called a sushi. So it's a <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, and that's uh, good. yeah, that's it's a yeah. They do you know, they you know, they like you know, like Christians of you know Catholics and Protestants. You yeah, know, when they're together sometimes. That's they, how I try to yeah. think about it. Yeah, but it's different because they're but, very serious about it. Yeah, but it been some in some cases Protestants and Catholics have been very serious too, and, and have slaughtered each other and and been no, awful to true. each other. So it's just maybe our. Our My U.S. centric view, in and, some ways, and our history is a little longer in the sense that it's, well, Christianity is an older religion, and we've had more more time to do terrible things to one another. But yeah, there's just been really a, just awful fighting between the two big branches of our faith, too. Right. Okay. So back to Yemen, Houthi Shiite, and then the other guys not. Right. And so we're bombing. You said if if we do have paramilitary or intel on the ground, it's a well kept secret, which I guess is how intel is supposed to work. But you said the U.S., the Brits, and the Danes are doing these bombing campaigns, particularly towards where that port is, yep. to protect the shipping. Mm. First of all, have we had recent examples of like of like some re very recent news stories of Houthis successfully like murking an entire ship or or even hijacking a yeah. ship or something like that? Yeah. So early on, they hijacked it. it. Was a tanker? I'm trying to remember what the name of it was, but they took over an entire ship and then. 
because it's social media age. They they you YouTube the crap out of it nice. or, did, or nice. you know, put it all on Instagram of them taking over the ship and here we are on the ship and hello uh, Akbar, hello yeah, Akbar. That's right. <laughs> there was even so just because it's it's a crazy time. There was a. One of the one of the guys was a fair, apparently a fairly attractive man, you know, with kind of sweeping hair and just just, and he became like a like a like an internet sensation because mm. he was like the the hooty hot hooty or something like that. But gotcha. uh, so there was that. They did sink one ship. Uh, I don't think anybody was injured, but they, right, they let's Google that Houthis sink ship. Yeah, and yeah, I think you'll end up seeing uh, uh, you know bottoms up with some uh, some. It wasn't a tanker. I think it was a cargo ship. But they've had some successes and they've hit a number more. Not as no, there we go. Okay. That, Ship recently hit by Yemen's six, Houthi rebels yeah, sinks yeah. in the Red Sea. First vessel lost in conflict. This uh, is from March 2024. Yeah, so it just happened. All right. So. A ship attack by Yemen's Houthi rebels has sunk in the Red Sea after days of taking on water, officials said Saturday. The first vessel to be fully destroyed as part of a campaign over Israel's war against Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Let's go down. The sinking of the Ruby Mar, which carried a cargo of fertilizer and previously leaked fuel, could cause ecological ecological damage to the Red Sea and its coral reefs. Yep. Persistent Houthi attacks have already disrupted traffic in the crucial waterway for cargo and energy shipments moving from Asia and the Middle East to Europe. Already many ships have turned away from the route. The sinking could further detour and, and create higher insurance rates being put on vessels plying the waterway, potentially driving up global inflation and affecting aid shipments to the region. Yeah. Okay. So the, the with these attacks, the Americans and the Brits have been doing, we've been trying to to reassure the, the shipping traffic that it's okay to come through here because we're going to have your back. Right. Uh, this Responding is gonna. Away. Yeah. This is this is not gonna not gonna help that effort very much at all. Got it. And and the fact that it was carrying fertilizer that that's, that's uh, not good. That's not good at all because no. that's. Uh, Essentially, that just um, will cause an explosion of algae growth, and you've got uh, you know, and, you know, fetid, contaminated water off the coast where a lot of the you know local populations uh, fish for a living. So that's oh that's yeah, not, not it's great. not good. Yeah. So, wh- when was the last time you were there, by the way? So in Yemen, the last time was probably mid 2012. So it's been a while since so I've been in Yemen proper. Now, what was it like then? Because my understanding is that this war really got. Hot, maybe like 2015, 2016, yeah. something like that. What was going on then? So that was a time where the 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 government uh, was you know, sort of the, the, our our guy in in Aden was 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 in. Oh, Is that Ali Abdullah Saleh? That's that it, was Saleh. the guy you, Saleh, you can yeah. remember his name. And yeah. he was uh, uh, what our government, the, the U.S. government, was trying to nudge him into reforming as a response to Arab Spring uh, uprisings, uh, and also trying to get him to to, to kind of promote. Peace talks between these various warring groups in Yemen. Obviously, they didn't go very well, and he eventually died. But I, my impression it was, let's say it's it is, it's it's like a, like going back into Bible times in the sense of the, the how you would imagine a biblical city to look. Mm. You know, it's like a lot of kind of mud buildings, but really ancient, and um, you know, and and just crowded narrow streets. And I remember. This was um, again. This was with Hillary Clinton's entourage when she was Secretary of State. So we, when oh, she they brought all the reporters. Brought all the reporters. So we, when, when the, uh, the Secretary of State travels, she always takes a you know a, a half a half a plane full of reporters because we all want to go see what what American diplomacy is up to. You get to sit next to her on the plane. Actually, not next to her. <laughs> She's got her own little compartment. But but she used to come back a lot, which was kind really? of fun. Yeah, she'd come back and have a beer with us sometimes. Old hill dogs have yeah. a beer with yeah, you in the she back. Would, Tell jokes and and you know it's the nice thing about being on one of those trips is that at a certain point people completely take their hair down, or or there's a dinner after you, you they've been on the road for five days and now we're just gonna kick back at a dinner and just have some drinks and tell stories, and that's Talk when about you, some wars yeah, to start yeah that's right <laughs> that's when you really get to to see what these people are like, but on this particular trip, so we're we're going down these winding roads that you know she, she's driving in SUVs big old you know honking things oh yeah and the, the roads will barely accommodated. So just squeezing through these little narrow lanes. So you're in an S, it's like a big caravan it's, Yeah, SUVs like five or six is, I mean, one of them. Got it. And okay. and because it's narrow streets and because there's huge throngs of people and now there's this VIP here that's there and uh, 
we suddenly just get swarmed. You know, people are just like coming up against the cars. And you can see the the, the you know the, the special the Secret Service guys getting really really nervous. Oh, yeah. We've got we've got bulletproof glass supposedly on, on the outsides. They're hitting on it. They're hitting on it. They're kind of pressing against it. They're not being hostile. They're actually kind of being welcoming, which was kind of nice. But it just felt like you know things could go south really quickly. <laughs> the only other time I felt like that was uh, in Tahrir Square in Cairo. This was after the mm. Mubarak was overthrown, oh, and yeah. and um, and but we were you know, the the U.S. government was trying to kind of express solidarity with the protesters and say we're, we're we're on the side of democracy and so hillary clinton goes to Tahrir square and gets out of the car and just mingles and just goes into the crowd there's still like just throngs of people in, just cairo. Hang, in cairo and you've never seen such nervous looking gun toters in your life all oh the guys with her with her entourage you could see the, the little uzis starting to come out of the, their uh, their jackets and they're just like fingers on the trigger waiting for something to go bad and she walked around for five minutes and you got back in the motorcade and off we went. But it's one of those moments that, gosh, this is very cool, but this could get really ugly fast. There is a lot you can say about that woman that's not great. But one thing of those is not that she doesn't have balls. She does. She's got a big I, fucking set on I her. Know. And the other time, I think it was the same trip, we went to Tripoli in Libya right after the fall of the Gaddafi government. And that country was being run by a bunch of warlords at the time. And these are like, <laughs> different rebel factions in control of different parts of the capital. And one of those groups happened to pick us up and they were our escorts from the airport into downtown Tripoli that day. So we're riding along the main coastal highway and it's these four or five vehicles and a bunch of guys riding shotguns and these little technicals, it's like pickup trucks with guns, you know, mounted machine guns and guys hanging out the windows with, um, you know, scarves on and masks. The regular ambiance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and we... We had no idea. I mean, I had no idea where we were going or what these guys are leading us to <laughs> and at what point along the road we're going to get shot at by somebody. But she seemed completely, you know, you know unflappable to all Just that. Just texting away. Just texting away. <laughs> and her little text thing on her Blackberry at the time. Did you say that was right after Benghazi? Right after. Well, I don't. I guess it was after Benghazi too. So it would have been after tough that. Tough time. Yeah, tough time. It was yeah. a tough time to be there for, you know, as an American diplomat. I think she knew uh, Chris Stevens, who was the guy that was killed. They were friends. And so it, was, it meant something to her personally. But it also was important, and you could see this at the time, that she really felt that 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 America had to stand for for freedom and democracy and and her other big issue was women's rights because this is a moment for women were beginning to sense political potential for themselves and here's the problem though like we can look at these situations you look at Saddam Hussein you yep. look at Muammar Gaddafi no one's going to argue these guys are good these guys were all scumbags yeah but it seems like we are very very bad as a country at spreading democracy because what we do is we knock the head off the snake, yep. but it's a snake that can grow back 10 heads and we create a giant yep. vacuum sucking sound, which is exactly what we've done in all these places. That's absolutely Over right. and over. Yeah. And to, to toggle back to Syria for a second on that that point, yeah. you know, we, people look back now and think, why didn't we, you know, just destroy Assad? You used chemical weapons. We should have like, you know, destroyed his regime. After a while, the smart people who've been, through this now multiple times, the Middle East with Iraq and other places started to worry, well, what if we did get rid of them? What happens next? Mm. It's, it's not going to be a democracy. It's probably going to be you know, a, a radical regime that we're going to hate even worse than these right. guys. At least we can kind of predict what Assad's going to do. He, he's, he's a survivor, so you can understand what his impulses are. But there, there was a real fear, and it was justified, that if Assad fell, the guys that come in after him are probably going to be worse. And um, I mean, it's kind of a lesson we learned in Egypt too. We thought, well, yeah, we'll, we'll support democracy. We'll, they, the, the Egyptians elected a Muslim Brotherhood government and started to, you know, ban women from, you know, wearing bathing suits and things like that. And so no, that's that's not what we, what we stand for. So we, we just we our ability to anticipate the values and thinking of of other people in other parts of the world, we almost always get it wrong. Yeah. So it has to come when you have to be humble in, when you approach these things because we just don't. We just don't get it most of the time. I remember back in episode 107 when I had Andy Bustamante in here, the former CIA guy. Well, if he's former. 
Did you ever have access to, let's say, government secrets that were so big that humanity could never find out about it? Humanity is too big of a word. So I would say I have absolutely had access to secrets that would impact how the American public would respond. What do you mean by that? Meaning I, the roles that I filled, the operations that I participated in, were operations that were relevant and impactful to Americans. They were relevant and impactful to other countries as well, but never humanity as a whole. Uh, talking about collegi culture. And that was, that was a term I was like very unfamiliar with at the time, but he talked about how there's really just this thing where it kind that culture kind of craves a strong man leader. Yeah. And in his mind, it's more like who's the strong man you know versus a strong man you don't. Exactly. Which is exactly what you're saying. And it kind of ties together. Now, I'm not a cultural expert of everything over there. I love learning about it. But like I'd be really curious to have been a fly on the wall with you over all these years going to all these places and seeing it and talking with some people and getting a feel for, for what they want. Like when you've had a chance in – doesn't matter what country, but in some of these countries that are maybe more chaotic, when you've had a chance to speak with say you know, swaths of locals there about mm. what they want in life, do you feel like – they want a lot of the same things that like Americans might want in their basic life, but they just don't realize that, you know, electing dictators is not the way to go yeah. or what's, what's your take there? Yeah. It gets really complicated. That's a great question because people in other parts of the world, and this is a generality, have kind of love hate for America. They think they envy us in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. They love a lot of things about our culture some things they think are just decadent and, and stupid, but they also admire what we've done as a, as a country. They admire our military, but they don't necessarily want to be like us. And that's really hard for us to get our heads around because we do think we're the, the greatest country in the world and we're for all the right things. It's not seen that way at all in, in other parts of the world. There's a lot of conspiratorial thinking about, about, about America and about the CIA. Everybody thinks they're all powerful and they're behind every bad thing that happens mm -hmm. in their parts of the world. And they gave us give us and our intelligence agencies a lot more credit than you know they, they deserve on those those kinds of issues. But the thing I, I, I find about basic values is on one level, people all want the same thing. They want to have a, you know safe homes. They want to be able to raise their kids and be able to aff afford a decent life. And that's mm -hmm. a distant dream for a lot of people, but that's something we all have in common. But how we get there, the things you need to have a, a comfortable mm -hmm. life, that's what's different. And so you go, I'll go to, just to name a country, United Arab Emirates, which is this small little country that's a neighbor to Saudi Arabia. Um, it's not a democracy. It's, 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 a, it's a monarchy. It's, it's, a, it's a very tightly controlled society. But people live well there because there's a lot of wealth. They don't want democracy as we have. They want things to be stable and predictable so they can send their kids to school and you know eat at a nice restaurant and have a decent life. But if there's a democracy there... They would worry that everything would change, and they would mm. be they have leaders that are crazy or that are extremists, and it, it would would not have the same. They wouldn't have the same quality of life, so they don't want what we have, and that's true for a lot of places mm. in the Middle East, particularly. If you get to to Europe, the traditions are completely different, and people generally want to have you know free democratic societies. A lot of parts of the world just don't see the value in that. It's just much too chaotic and much too unpredictable. So, is it more? I'm trying to picture like how to think like this. It's very hard. But are people quite literally saying to you like, I don't want the right to vote. I just want that guy to tell me everything. Or are they saying basically, I want the strong leader to do X, Y, or Z and not realizing that they're also kind of giving away their agency in the process when they do that? Like, yeah. Which is it? It's more, more the latter. More people thinking that I probably couldn't control those things anyway. I mean, we can say, look at our own situation is like, you know, we have, in theory, freedom to do a lot of things. We, in practice, we can't control very much. Right. And so we, the, we, those become abstract issues even for us. We just kind of focus on our own lives and trying to have the best quality of life we can. And these people, you know, generalizing again, um, they, they just, they, 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 they just want to be quiet and keep to themselves. I even get those expats, like taking again UAE, people who've lived there for years, they, but they're from Britain or somewhere else. They they realize that it's it's in some ways a police state. You can't 
go to the corner and you know yell at something bad ag- against the you know the leader of Abu Dhabi, mm. and, and you can get in big trouble, maybe get evicted if if not worse. But that's okay. They just would not want to make trouble anyway. They just want to have a nice, comfortable life, and so they end up living there for decades and thinking it's a pretty cool place. I live a very nice life. I have a nice villa. I, I do good. You know, I could travel and things like that. I don't need the democracy part, which is uh, just a, just something that doesn't really make a difference in my life. So what about the people who maybe don't have the villa and yeah. are more lower class? Do yeah. they feel differently, or do they explain it away somehow? Yeah, and again, it depends on on whether your your uh, your your sponsor or the strongman in your country is on your side or not. There's mm. like, next to UAE, there's a country called Bahrain where majority of the population is Shiite and fairly poor. The the rule the government is is Sunni, mm. and if you go talk to people in Shia neighborhoods, they'd say, "Well, we don't we don't have any agency. We we feel like we were oppressed," um, and and so they they will, will will say to you, "We'd love to have more of a say in our lives." Other parts of the country, you know, they talk to Sunnis and they don't feel that way at all. So it's it sometimes does depend on what neighborhood you live in and what you know and how your group uh, fits within the you know in, within the structure of the country. It's fascinating. Well, going back to Yemen, just because we went on a tangent from that there. So we've kind of covered like what's going on there, and we're going to dovetail this into Iran in a minute, I'm sure. But, oh, is that you? Are you in there? I, I, I might be. I, I, it's hard to tell in the back, maybe four or five rows, but there's a guy with a blue tie. I can't. Anyway, I'm I'm there in that crowd somewhere. Um, that's, yeah, we're looking on the screen right now. Yeah. There. There's all kinds of images. Yeah, so I'm I'm there that day, and you could see some of the Secret Service guys. Uh, they're they don't they're not called that at the State Department. There's but, there's Huma. Yeah, there's Huma. She's right there. there and, is that Wolf Blitzer? I think it is. Yeah, Wolf was on that trip. I remember. Okay. I think that's uh, might be Andrea Mitchell, kind of to the left of of uh, Huma or to our left. Oh, they got the who's who over there for this one. Yeah, that was a it was a big trip just because of the places we were going. So you know, all the network guys sent sent someone, hmm. and the the print people like me were were kind of. In the the back. The, yeah, the the ink stained wretches in the back stay of the bus. In your corner. Yeah, we stay in our corner. <laughs> so, That's funny. Yeah. So anyway, right now you still have essentially Saudi and Iran kind of funding both sides. Like Iran's definitely funding the Houthis. Yeah. Are the Houthis making progress at taking over the full country? Is that like you know, is that sea of red, if you will, starting to move? Like, what's what's going on? So they've been able to solidify certain parts of the country and, and kind of consolidate their control. There are other parts of, of Yemen that won't have anything to do with the Houthis. So up, up close, and they keep them out. Keep them out. Hmm. And so that's – there are ongoing – talks, or at least until recently, between different factions trying to get some kind of uh, confederation, some kind of way for them to all live together without being one being under the other. And that uh, has always been just just on the brink of happening, but it hasn't. And uh, and now since the Gaza crisis, the, the Houthis are more interested in just being agitators and you know, bomb throwers, Got it. literally in this case. Okay. And at the middle of Everything we're talking about is obviously what happened on October 7th and the enormous aftermath that has gone on since then. So I'm sure that's going to be coming up where you see it fit to bring up the color commentary on that, do that. But Iran is Mm -hmm. really, really what I wanted to talk with you about because this is something that, you know, when I had Jim Lawler in here, he had serious concerns about. Obviously, he was, if he is retired, he was a 25-year spy for CIA that specialized in weapons of mass destruction. I think that's the kind of work he did. So Iran was certainly something he was heavily involved with. It's interesting to talk with you because your expertise was in the field undercover with nuclear arms deals and things like that. And it's like the whole reason we went to Iraq was because they had WMD and that turned out to not be true. That's exactly right. People ask me about that sometime. And it is it is true that Saddam Hussein had been working on nuclear weapons before then. He had used chemical weapons against the Kurds. The Kurds are an ethnic group yes. there in Iraq. Killed thousands of them. In fact, one of his cousins was known as Chemical Ali. And Chemical Ali used And he had serious concerns about where that could go. Maybe at at the beginning, though, it it would be good to start with some of the foundation because, again, like sometimes some of these things get lost in history for some people out there just to get sped up. Can you just explain 
Iran leading up to the revolution and then the revolution itself, like when, when the Shah was in charge, who he was, how that all happened, and then how it went to shit. Yeah, so people may be real surprised to hear this, but, but Iran was a really close ally of the United States. Yeah. We, we supported the Shah of Iran. They were, the other good, other good friends in the region was the Israelis. The Iranians and the Israelis were pretty tight. And mm. You could travel back and forth. It was, uh, they, they were supporters of Israel. Um, there's no question that the Shah was, was a, you know, he was a, an autocrat. Uh, he was very, uh, very brutal against people who, who disagreed with him and, and, and resisted his, his regime. Uh, and because of that, uh, there was, you know, this resent, resentment against him and against his backers, the United States in particular, continued to grow over, over many years. And, and by the time the Iranian revolution took place, uh, you know, people were, thrilled to, to, to cal- kick out the Shah and, and and saw us as the great Satan and, and the one who enabled him to to, to rule their country in, in a brutal fashion for, for so many years. How do you get... I, yeah. I, under, I understand people didn't like the Shah. Fully get that. I've always been curious, though, how you get a country of people where you could have pictures like this one we have on the screen mm. where people are out looking like it's America and women in bikinis, men in regular bathing suits having a good time. So many people in the country support like those types of freedoms. And then suddenly this crazy Ayatollah comes in and says like, Allah Akbar, death to Israel in the United States. And by the way, everyone put on a burqa. Yeah. You know, like how, how does, how do you get people from that, enough people from that to that to yeah. take over the whole country? Yeah. It's, it's something that I never can quite understand. And I've been places like Afghanistan, where if you look at pictures of Afghanistan in the mm-hmm. 50s and 60s, same kind of images. You see women in, in smart, you know, Western business clothes. Now you go there and you you wear a, a, a dress like you could could have worn in the fifties yeah. and sixties. You get arrested if not something much worse. And and some women just resent you know that that loss of freedom. And yet you also find many women who 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 don't who at least embrace the the modesty of of a veil. Feel like it makes them more comfortable. Feels like they're less of an object. It respects their privacy. So you'll you'll get into, you know, I've gotten into really interesting discussions with women who say this is this actually feels better to me. It feels more natural to how, me. How do they explain it? They, they see it's um. First of all, they see they think of us as as objectifying women and mm. sexualizing women uh, to to an extreme. And um, mm. and so the men I've I've talked to ones are very conservative um, um, Muslim men will. That's the first subject they'll get on. It's just how decadent we are, and how we, and we we claim to honor women and treat women as you know as independent and you know and and just you know welcome their freedom, when in fact we're we're, we're sex obsessed in mm-hmm. this country. So everything is is sexualized, and they see that as as a perversion of of nature and offensive, uh, and and they they don't want what we have in that in that sense, and um, and many women who grow up in that culture feel kind of the same way. They may resist some of the more oppressive things, like the the full bee suits that right. we see. But um, but is that some really what it's called a bee suit. Yeah, a bee beehive beekeeper suit. Yeah, <laughs> the, the the really extreme burkas oh. where you can't. You know, I, yeah, I've, I know what you're talking yeah. about. I didn't know it was I, actually. I, I know. You know, it, I've I've been you know in an airport in uh, you know in Middle East countries, and and you see the women with this, this full regalia, and and watch them try to eat. You know, it's like. It's it's How really they, hard to do. They, like, so you got to lift the you got to lift the veil. I got it. It's like a it's like a acrobatic act. You got to kind of get your fork up in there, and it it just looks really it's like hard. the fucking cookie monster. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it just sort of the food disappears behind the veil, and it and to me, I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, boy, that that looks really hard, a. Yeah. Eh? And then why do you have to go through that? And and yet it's it, it's interesting that you also see these same women kind of take pride in little things. Like you can see the eyes and the eyes are really done up. You know, you've got yeah. all kinds of makeup and eyeshadow. And Wait, underneath the behind? Yeah, or if you can see a little bit of the eye, and often you can. So th- these these real extremes, you can't see anything. But some of the other, um, like th- 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 like that that one. So the, the Saudis where you get little opportunities to flirt or, or to kind of... You get your flirting yeah, on in the airport, with, Joby. With just a with a half inch of, of you try opening to take a beehive home. That's, that's right. <laughs> but um, but but also just feel um, comfortable in their own way, yeah, man. and then and just and I must say I've 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 been surprised again and again when I have the courage to ask you know a woman in, in an outfit like that, and only be in a, in a circumstance where we're having a, a deep conversation about something else and. 
how do you feel about this? And it's often, it's defended in that way. This makes me feel a little less exposed. I feel comfortable in my own little cocoon mm-hmm. here and it, and I feel respected like this. And so, and, and they look at a, a mini skirt or a, a bikini and think that just is an abomination. So it just, the cultures in that area are just a million miles apart. I remember reading in school, actually, a series of like dense literary comic books. It was, I think it was called Persepolis. I forget. Can we look? Do yeah, you remember that lesson? I read it. Yeah. Okay. So that was pretty eye opening to me because, you know, this, this woman, I forget her name. Maybe you can Google it. But she was there when the Ayatollah took over and it shows like all the regular pop culture, what they had. And then afterwards it turned into this dystopian, you know, scary place, Mm -hmm. right? And it was always eye-opening to me because you realize how quickly society is capable of changing overnight. And that's obviously kind of what we were just talking about. But when they took over in 1979, a lot of people at least have heard of like the Iran, the Iranian hostage crisis. There was a movie Argo made about that as well. And so obviously didn't get off on a good (laughs) foot there because they they wanted to kill us. But for the last, I guess, 40, almost, yeah, 45 years – effectively the it's been status quo right like yeah. they're they hold the same exact beliefs they have the same deadly type chance at the same religious restrictions on the people like nothing's changed so to speak right well yeah there's i mean at least of on the the religious elites or the rulers have very much kind of kept the same codes you do see and it's been been clearer now for the last few years the resistance building um, below, you know, uh, below the regime, though, and it's you see that in these these really amazing protests in, in the last year and a half by women who refuse to wear the veil, and when it goes from being okay, well, I, I I like to have the option of wearing the veil, but but now you're forcing me to do it. That's the part where you really start to, you know, get more resistance, and so you've had very brave women in Iran. You just taking taking off the veil or burning the veil and getting in trouble. Some cases being arrested and tortured because of that. What was the first catalyst of that? Like who who did something that yeah. started that? So the woman's name is lost on me, but it was just a a woman who 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 just made a show of you know of of rejecting the veil and just was was arrested and beaten and then dies in prison. Mm. And because of that, this this uh, like a, a a movement grows up around her and it's still still thriving. It kind of comes and goes in waves, but every now and then you'll see you know uh, an outburst of people, you know, having a, like a flash demonstration, you know, in, in protesting the veil or or pushing back in other ways. And and the the regime's way of of cracking down, they have their morality piece, police who can go around and arrest somebody if they have too much of their face showing or or God forbid, you know, some you know, ankle or something that just offends them. Mm. But you also have, um, you know, there's been these these weird incidents of mass poisonings, mostly of schoolgirls, and there um, there must have been fifteen poisonings. Tw- tw- yeah, we have an entire you know grade school, like a women's or girls school. Uh, the, the entire school comes down with 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 a you know with some kind of poison, not fatal, but it's something to make them all sick. And it's happening, you know, it happened um, so many times that it's pretty clear that it would, it's organized. And Why it's, are they doing it's that? Just, it was a way to kind of signal to women, signal to girls that you you know, know your place or something bad is going to happen to you. Um, so that's that's part what what the Iranians are, you know, the Iranian citizens are up against. It's funny, the, the Iranians have the highest... As a, as a country, f- have the best view of Americans of pretty much any group in the Middle really? East. Really? Yeah. So now, like, if 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 you do an opinion poll, most Iranian um, c- citizens love America and would love to come here. It's their leadership that hates it so much, and they have enough of support they're able to have these these you know almost ritualistic demonstrations where they chant "Death to America" and and then their their the government, which is unbelievably corrupt, um, you know fights fights America at every opportunity. Do we have any good data that could give us some sort of ballpark percentage breakdown of what percentage of the country supports the current regime versus once it overthrown? The, the polls I've seen and I can't quote specifics but it's it's well over uh, 50%. So it's like a, it's a it's a plurality at least of, of people that have a, a fairly high regard of America and would like to see 
improved relations at least, if not uh, an overthrow of, of the of the clerical regime. Yeah, I would think you can't have one without the yeah. other. You can't like believe like, oh, I love America and want them to be friends and still support the regime being yeah. in place. I have friends that uh, that still have family in, in Tehran, and they go back there for family visits. And they describe this weird uh, sort of dualistic existence where young people go to parties, they drink, they take mm. off the veils, they have a you know a nice time. Whoa! And and um, and then then they have to kind of put the veil back on to to, to go out in the street. So they they kind of there's a hypocrisy with it where people are kind of forced into certain kinds of behavior and they follow the rules not to get in trouble. But they don't like it very much. And then if they got caught at a party like that, they're yeah, could end up going to jail. Although, because you know, people in, in families, you know, the, the children of of the regime leaders do the same kinds of things. So it gets it's it's pretty pervasive, as, as it's described to me, particularly in the big cities like Tehran, where young people just want to live like young people, and they do. They go to their parties and they and they they have drinks and and dance, and they just can't be public about it. And so even though the, those protests, I believe, started like fall 2022 yeah, is when that girl, right. I don't know if we can pull up that article, Alessi, but if we can Google Iranian woman oh. murdered in prison. Yeah, that should do it. Let's try that. Pull that up because I'd, I'd love to just get her name on it because she started it and then there were there were hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. It that ended a, up, they were protesting in public. Yeah, it was a mass movement okay. and, and it was really worrisome. Yeah, type, click That's that. That's it, Death of Masa Amini. Amini. Yeah. Uh, okay. Did we lose it? In a report released on 8 March 2024, the United Nations Human Rights Council concluded that Amini's death was caused by physical violence she suffered while in moral while in morality police custody. It's crazy they have something yeah. called morality police. Yeah. The report found Iran responsible for her death and claimed the government had attempted to hide the truth and intimidate Amini's family rather than conduct an impartial investigation. In addition, the report and evidence of widespread human rights violations during Iran's response to protests in 2022 and 2023 with many amounting to crimes against humanity. The, the report found evidence of widespread. Mm. Okay. I mean, that's not surprising because they were arresting people and there were other people who were killed in prison. Yeah. And it makes makes our position as Americans what to do and say about these things really difficult because we want to support women like this. And at the same time, we don't want to be, we don't want to give the Iranian regime an excuse to say, oh, this is an American-led movement. We don't want to give the sense that we're instigating it somehow. So we have to be really calibrated in how we respond to these things. Um, supporting the women and supporting the protests without, you know, being more active than that. Sure. And um, because that, the last thing you want to do is just to take that big segment of the Iranian population that that likes us and and turn them against us because they. That's right. Yeah, because they feel like we're meddling. Alessi, can you also Google what Joby was talking about with the schoolgirls who were poisoned? This was new. Yeah. I was unaware of this. Yeah. That's fucking crazy that they were doing that so yeah. they weren't killing them but they were poisoning them so making them massively sick just as a way to say like we own you yep and you'll see yeah if you look up that okay just, yeah hit that iranian school girls mass poisoning reports okay some of them were um the iranian school girls mass poisoning reports are a series of alleged chemical attacks during which students in dozens of schools in iran were reportedly poisoned in various and undetermined manners by unidentified perpetrators. Yeah. These events started in November 2022. Oh, I wonder who could have done it. Yeah. At the Ishfan, Ishfan University of Technology and reports of thousands of students being poisoned in ongoing assaults were claimed to have occurred in the following months. Many psychogenic illnesses, MPI, have been identified as possible cause of the incidents, this is due to similarities of the Iranian situation to other claim mass poisonings. Of you, okay, so they're trying to explain this away. Yeah, but th there's there's so little evidence because obviously we right. can't send investigators in to look at it. But it just seems incredible to me that um, that that well, if schools of you know girls would just you know repeatedly make these things up. There have been some incidences that, at least that sure. And and this what I've read the what I've seen on this it suggests that supporters of the regimes and these um besieged groups uh that kind of goon squads essentially for the Iranian government uh could be behind some of it, but it's it's a phenomena. I can't remember how many different incidents, but it's more than a more than twenty as I recall. There have been groups that have been tracking them from the outside. Whoa. Now how does like we were talking earlier about Iran's 
alliance between the Ayatollah and Assad with Syria, which allows them to get, I guess they go across northern Iraq now, which is no man's land in some way, and allows them to get access to the Mediterranean and the whole bit. But how are they surviving? Because all these other countries around the world, I know we have it, a lot of other major first world countries have it, like you have to say you're not going to do business with Iran just to work at a bank yeah. or something like that. So they are economically sanctioned out the ass. Yeah. Obviously, the nuclear deal, which was, I don't even know what the hell that deal was, that was canceled. So all those things went back on. But how are, who are they allied with, I assume in the East, and how are they making money to support the country and not starve everybody? Yeah. So they've been doing this for long enough that they've gotten really good at, at just running in runs around around the sanctions that we've imposed. And the sanctions have been really tough. Um, it's what kind of forced the Iranians to the bargaining table back in 2014 when we did get a, a deal with them on their nuclear program. But the, uh, you know, I'm just actually looking at some material right now and we're, we're thinking about writing about this. But the so the complexities of some of these networks for selling stuff to make money, they have a lot of oil and they have a lot of gas. Mm. So they can sell the oil if they can make it look like it's Iraqi oil, which they can do easily now because you know, oh. they're, they're good friends with the Iraqis. So You've got a you know a tanker full of oil. It's from Iraq. You, if you do a forensic investigation, sometimes you can tell. Oh, it's not Iraqi. It's from somewhere else. But they get away with that a lot. They also have clients that don't don't either don't particularly care about the sanctions or actually are very happy to violate them. That includes the Chinese in particular. So they sell a lot of oil to the Chinese, <laughs> to the Indians as well, because it's it's because you can if you're under sanctions and you can't sell oil legitimately, you have to sell it at a discount. So if you're a country that's looking to get some cheap oil. Well, here's where you get it. And they're also just like these really crazy um, systems that have been set up with um, Iranian oil that ends up going to some broker in Iraq and then gets the money gets laundered in a Russian bank and then, uh, you know, or through Turkey and, and it all comes back to the Iranians and sometimes uh, goes to some of these militia groups. They fund their militia groups through proceeds from oil sales for the most part. Right. So making not only enough to survive as a country, but enough to keep their, their little proxy groups going. How good is their own military? So like, we'll talk about the militia groups some more in a bit, but like, what does their military look like? The, the scary thing about their military right now is their capability with missiles, because they've, they've been working on missiles for a long time, and drones as well. And so we see them mostly using, uh, the Russians using Iranian drones in Ukraine right now, because the, the, the Iranian drones are pretty good. And uh, they've they've actually been able to develop jet powered drones, which act almost like cruise missiles. Um, they keep pushing the limits on the on the on the missiles and rockets they make. So there is there are a handful of countries that can make um, make missiles pretty well, and they've become um, they're part of that group now. They they have pretty formidable capabilities. Mm. They're working on. Um, satellite launch vehicles, which means essentially ICBMs. If you can launch a satellite in space, you've got a multi-stage rocket that could also, you could potentially put a warhead on. So that's something they're working on a lot right now. Other areas are not as, I mean, they don't have a, um, a great air force because they still fly um, old jets that they had when the Shah was in, in power. <laughs> they keep kind of patching those up and using them. One of the scary things that uh, that's going on right now, and I'm something I'm concerned about is Russia and Iran are becoming real partners now. And the, the Iranians- How so? The, so Iran, uh, Russia, both of them are kind of international outlaws at, right. at the moment. So Russia needs air defense systems, they need artillery ammunition, and more and more they're partnering with the Iranians to get a lot of that stuff. So the Iranians and, and, and Russians are now, they have a joint factory that's run inside Russia that's making Iranian drones that they keep sort of testing and, and improving and trying to make them better. The, the the Russians are good at certain things with flight mechanics and um, you know, you know uh, sort of structural you know the structural components of, of planes so they make the Iranians design better and send it back to Iran and, and so Iran has a better missile or a better drone too so there's that uh, kind of uh, of um, assistance going on and now the, the 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 Russians have agreed to sell the Iranians sophisticated jet fighters so Su 35s so agreements have been made we haven't seen any of them flying over Iranian airspace, but but we know from intel intercepts that the, that the Russians have agreed to sell some of their top-of-the-line fighters to the Iranians. And that's potentially a game changer, along with air defense systems that could make it really hard for us or for the Israelis to attack nuclear sites, for example, mm. in the future, because the Russians have been able to have helped them harden their defenses and, and um, build better anti anti-missile systems. How much does Russia have access to, like, 
some of these places, including Syria right now, because they're a little bit locked off from the world. Like, are they able to get, it's, it's hard for me to picture because there's like this, no pun intended, like this iron curtain yeah. that has now descended where everyone else is like, yo, fuck Russia. Yeah. So how are they even, how are they even getting back and forth to yeah. some of these places? So yeah, Syria is no problem because they have, they still have their port there, their, their naval base. But can they, but they have to go through stuff to yes, get there, so right? Yes, they go through the Black Sea and that's been a little more difficult now because the Turks have created problems for them, but they... They can still get vessels in and out, and they um, they've also built a, a major air base too, and that's something that's happened since 2013. The Russians moved in in a in a big way militarily to to help defend the Syrian regime, and that included a, a brand new Russian air base. So they they have a lot of their transport carriers and and, and fighter jets based in Syria now. So it's not okay. a problem for them to get there. And then, do we have like is the Ayatollah going and meeting with like Xi Jinping? Is anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> he sure meets with the Putin a lot, and there's uh, that's become a very cozy relationship. Mm. And that that really is that's fly a on big the wall on change, that one, right? Because in the past, you think of the as you know Iran being a client state. You know, there's kind of a complicated Rus- relationship between the Russians and and the and uh, the Iranians. Now they're they're not just good buddies, but they're they're partners. Mm. And when you have two fairly capable adversaries who are now on the same team together, they're both international pariahs, but they now they're an alliance. And so they they can help each other with all kinds of things around the world. Everything from averting sanctions, selling oil, you know, improving their missile systems. So it's it's uh it's a concern and throw North Korea into that too and because they're they've now become you know a closer partner to Russia because they've got things the Russians want too like artillery shells they can use in Ukraine. Where is Iran's nuclear program these days? So I'm really concerned about that, and I've been watching it for, boy, about 15 years. And for the longest time, the concern was that, well, you know, Russia, Iran says it doesn't want a nuclear weapon, but gee, they're sure accumulating a lot of, of fissile materials, so the stuff you make, you know, the, the stuff that, that explodes in a, in a nuclear bomb. In the last three years, we've seen a, a pretty big change with the Iranians. They're now making not just the low enriched uranium, which they were pretty good at making, the stuff you can put in a, a nuclear power plant. Now it's it's high enriched uranium. It's 60% mm. enriched. It's very, very close to weapons grade. And they're at this point now where they're, they've, they can, you could take six, this, this higher uh, uh, enriched uranium and turn it into weapons grade just in a few days. So if they wanted to break out, they would have the fissile material they, they needed to make a bomb within, literally within a week or two. So that close to having a weapons capability. We think that now they're they they they're kind of acting like a nuclear capable state, which means that they know that there's big trouble if they actually detonate a bomb. All kinds of bad things could happen, so they're kind of being ambiguous about it and 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 sort of telling the world that you know, wink, wink, we could make a bomb if we want to, and that's not just a bluff anymore. They've got the the material, the fissile material to make weapons. They worked um, really hard on a weapons design up until 2003. We don't know for sure what they did after that. But as of 2003, they had the ability to make at least a crude weapon that you could put on a truck and blow up. It probably would take them a bit longer to develop a missile with a warhead, uh, with a nuclear warhead, but that's, that's not that far in the future either. Hey guys, if you have a second, please be sure to share this episode around on social media and with your friends, whether it's Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, doesn't matter. It's all a huge help. It gets new eyeballs on the show and it allows us to grow and survive. So thank you to all of you who have already been doing that and thank you to all of you who are gonna do so now. So we're at a point now, what's also dangerous about right now after after the Gaza crisis, um, the Iranians felt kind of secure within its network of proxy groups, Hamas, Hezbollah, the mm-hmm. Syrian militias, Yemen. That that was their deterrent because if anybody attacked Iran, they could expect that these From other the militia other groups would come yeah. after if, if the Israelis or anyone else. But that's, you know, because the Hamas is, you know, may soon be history or, or is, is no longer going to be the, the, the threat that it once did. So that deterrent network for Iran is eroding. It's going away a little bit. And so will that be the thing that drives them to, to, into thinking we really need a, a nuclear deterrent too? And that's not bad news just for the Iranians, but or but it's, you know, if, if Iran gets a bomb, not much question the Saudis are going to want to have a nuclear weapon too, maybe the, maybe the Emiratis and others. So it could start a, a nuclear arms race in the Middle East, which is the last place in the world you want to have one. Is the Ayatollah or even just the leadership structure of Iran, though, so narcissistically, religiously fanatical as to say, fuck it, 
and launch a nuke at Israel or the United States when they probably, I think, are smart enough to know. I'm giving them maybe too much credit there, but I would assume they're smart enough to know if they did that. My guess would be that Iran would be wiped off the face of the earth. Yeah. So they they are survivors. And whatever their other problems, they're, they, they don't seem to be crazy in that sense. Mm. They don't want to invite Armageddon on themselves. There are other countries, you, you can't be as sure about that. We're, we're never sure what Kim Jong-un is, is thinking half the time. The Iranians don't seem to be irrational in that way. What they do, I think they do see value in being able to bluff and to, to you know to essentially use their nuclear program as as a lever and say if you push us too hard, we can make we can have a bomb pretty quickly. So if you want to go that way, we'll, we'll, we can go that way, and that's I think that's where we're going now, and that's that's destabilizing in itself, and that pushes other countries into looking at the possibility of getting nuclear weapons and thinking that might be an attractive thing for them to do. Where do you think our relationship with Iran or or Iran's place in the world is five years from now? So <laughs> it's hard to be optimistic about anything in the region and, and in particular the Iranians. <laughs> there, there are a lot of things though that are, that you could maybe squint and, and try to be a little bit hopeful. One is the fact that the Supreme Leader is, is an old man is, is gonna die pretty soon. That whole generation of, you know, the sort of veterans of the, of the revolution back in the late seventies, they're fading out pretty quickly. Mm. So we don't know what the next generation is gonna be like. There have been, you know, moderate, semi-progressive leaders in Iran's recent history. Even even after the revolution, there were some that were willing to negotiate with us and accommodate, you know, um, our interest in some, to some degree. So you can't rule that out. And there's also the, this fact that there is a huge portion portion of the, of the population in Iran that that wants to live under a different system. They don't want to live under a theocracy. They're educated. They're they're, they're sophisticated, they're proud of their culture. I mean, my God, Iranians are really, really proud of, of Persian culture and its antiquity and all the things that it's accomplished over the years. They don't wanna be led by religious zealots. And so the, the hopeful thinking, and maybe it's a little bit naive, is to think that eventually that that dominant view is, is gonna have a more of a political voice than it does now. Well, how did the protests die down? I mean, there was a time there. I remember when Jim was Jim Lawler was here December twenty twenty two. We were looking at it and I'm like, this feels a little different. It yeah. feels like something could happen and then it yeah. kind of went away. Like how how did they get control of that and, and is there any sort of civil disagreement going on there now? Yeah. Yeah. So it was pretty much beat down. But those those attitudes and those views still exist, right? And that's why you still see occasional flare-ups where there'll be a, a protest that'll happen on one day, uh, and you you get the sense that the thing is still alive. Those views and those attitudes and that resentment has not gone away, and it's just I think I hope um, that if if history is kind to us, there'll be a, a time when those 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 voices will will find a way sure. to be heard. Uh, it may not happen in the next you know ten years, but hopefully sometime in the near future. Is it, what, what's their like access on social media over there? Is a lot of it blocked by a lot of it's firewall? blocked, but they they have pretty robust networks. They have ways. It's like Telegram channels or other mm. ways of speaking. It's not the same platforms that we use necessarily. So they can organize. They can, and uh, and there are a lot of Iranians that travel, and and or Iranians that know people that travel. So if you're middle class and and higher, uh, you've probably been somewhere else. So you know how other people live, and you know how to get onto Facebook or whatever uh, platform that you want to read. So they're they're not ignorant of what's going on in, in the outside world. Unlike the North Koreans, for example, that have you know very limited ability to, to see what anyone else outside uh, North Korea is doing. Mm. Well, a guy I'd love to get on the podcast, I haven't worked on it yet, but the guy Reza Pahlavi, yeah. who is the son of the Shah, who obviously was kicked out in 79 and then died in in exile shortly yeah. after that but he under that lineage would be the next in charge but you know not necessarily how it would go if the country was taken over but he's he and his family have lived in the united states since then so he came here i guess as a young man yeah 79 i think yeah something like that and you know he's done. It, he's talked to a couple people he's talked to piers morgan i think he did a sit down with patrick bet david and he's a very fascinating guy. Yeah. And one thing that he seems to have done a good job of since 1979 as he was growing up and becoming his own guy is he 
is a world visitor and communicator with all kinds of Iranian refugees in different countries and is kind of playing to that cultural identity and hey we could go take this back we could return to our land yeah. and get it do you think something like that would be a possibility because when he's faced with this question like hey would you be open to being back in charge he's very careful to be like you know let's chill with that i'd, yeah. I'd like to see a free iran like he kind of punts it like do you think something like that is possible and th the second part of the question is and i'm not saying this is a bad thing i think this is probably a good thing but that guy's kind of like a U.S. asset. Like, yeah. he lives here. I'm sure the intelligence community is very good friends with him. Like, that could totally change Iran to, like, a friend, I would guess, and CIA and those places would be happy if he was in charge. Yeah. Yeah, I've actually I met him at a, at a dinner party one time, and he's, mm. he's a really interesting guy, like you say. And there is a huge community in the United States of, of Iranian expats or just descendants of Iranian um, re refugees. And there's a lot of them here, and a lot of them would like to see – something happened, something, some change in their country that they could help and support in some way. The one danger, it's always harder for outside groups to influence the course of a, you know, mm. a, what's happening politically inside a country. We learned that a bit in Iraq where there was a big Iraqi exile community and some of the Iraqi exiles were CIA assets and they were telling us things like, oh, if you go into Iraq, you'll be you'll greeted as liberators. And by the way, Saddam has weapons of mass destruction and we think they're here, here, and here. And I actually <laughs> met with those people too in the run-up to the Iraq war and they were pretty convincing. And really we thought that these guys were going to be able to, you know, they'd come in on our tanks and take over the government and everybody would, would love them and welcome them. It turns out it's hard if you've been outside to come and have credibility and, and tell people, you know, here's, here's what your government should be like. So it would be much better for the Iranians if this happened organically. It's some, somehow within the country itself maybe with support and, and inspiration from Iranians on the outside, but it may be something that has to come from inside the country. But if it did come from inside the country and then he was called upon, I guess that's possible, right? Yeah, sure it is. I mean, there there are some people that will think it's great that he was the son of the Shah. Um, others will think, uh, no, we hated the Shah. We don't want that right. again. But I think it'd be an interesting voice in that mix and maybe somebody with some authority because he's uh, he's been kind of a, a focal point for a lot of the opposition groups and people to rally around. So he has a lot of connections and a lot of things he could bring to the table if, if given a chance. How long did you get to talk with him? So it was a dinner party. It was at an embassy and it was probably eight or nine years ago. And I think he was there with his wife and it just, he was charming, you know, very smart. I uh, had a pretty sophisticated view of what was going on and what was possible and what wasn't a deep, deep hatred, I can't even tell you, <laughs> toward the regime and just oh, yeah. the, the, the guys that are outside just, they, they, they view the, 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 the Ayatollah and his, his cronies with such you know, vehemence. It's just, yeah. and, and you, you can't blame them because a lot of them have had their own family members killed or, or yes. tortured under, under that regime. And even now, one of the awful things, one of the many awful things the Iranians do is is target dissidents outside Iran. And so there have been people, uh, a fairly famous case a couple of years ago where an Iranian from California, he's a, he's a US yeah. citizen, goes to the Emirates, goes to UAE, Abu Dhabi or Dubai for a meeting and gets lured into, I don't, it, we don't know exactly what happens, but he gets essentially whisked out of that country, taken to Amman, and then next thing you know, he ends up in a prison. Yeah. And he's on essentially on death row in Iran. So if you if you're a dissident, it could can get you killed. There's a woman I'm trying to bring in for a podcast. I've been talking with her team. We'll see if it can happen. But she's here in New York. This this woman, Masia Alinejad. I hope I said that right. But she's pretty amazing. She she is willing to talk anywhere to anyone uh, like around the world. I yep. mean, like at different forums, usually events. I haven't really seen her on podcasts, but. She's known for having big, beautiful hair because that's like her that's fuck a, you yeah. to the government. Yeah. And she essentially was – she was targeted in the United States by an Iranian hit team yeah. that was fortunately thwarted, I believe, by the FBI and caught and it was stopped. But, you know, they were, they were trying to kill her here, yeah. like in the United States, which is – I guess maybe it's not that crazy to think about, but that's – the these guys are ruthless they yeah. are they are cutthroat they are they want to beat down 
any opinion that that could go against them. I mean, it's it's a true form of like you know religious fascism, if yeah, you will. Yeah, and they've they've done it not only against Iranians, but there was real famous case um, where they they had there was a plot to kill. I think it was a Saudi diplomat in Washington D.C. And the plot involved bombing a restaurant where he where he liked to go. So if they had succeeded, they would have potentially killed people. yeah killed all those people, including a lot of people just having a nice dinner on a, on a on a weeknight. And um, you know the, the good thing of the saving grace is that it was so clumsy, and the guys they they enlisted to do this job were just idiots, and they just <laughs> kept kept kind of like f- tripping all over themselves. And and before. Before they got anywhere close to doing it, you know, the, the FBI was all over the case, and so they just rolled it up. But it does show you the kind of the the audaciousness that they they think they can even go into to to United States and 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 kill somebody at will, and that's you know pretty pretty horrible thing to think about. Um, and the other thing to remember about the Iranians is is it's not the government there is not necessarily monolithic. It's controlled by a you know a, a theocratic leader, the Ayatollah, but there are also factions within the Iranian government. Mm. There's groups of hardliners that uh, that are more aggressive even than than the Ayatollah is, and sometimes more aggressive this, than yeah, the Ayatollah, a little less, shall we say, cautious in some of their planning. So that this this one uh, one one group that was uh, this this attempt to, to do this bombing. There were some uh, people in the what's called the IRGC, which is the yes. Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, who were pushing this plot, and it was never clear at all that that on the Ayatollah's level that he knew anything about it. It was just kind of like they were freelancing on this. So there there are factions within the government that are even more more hardcore than the leadership, and and could do you know are capable of almost anything. What was the plot? So this is the one where they're going to bomb oh, a restaurant bomb the restaurant in, in DC. Okay. Yep. All right, got it. So that was them, and he wasn't even aware. Wow, yep. that's interesting. Where did Soleimani fall on that spectrum? So he was a, a really dangerous guy, in part because he was a visionary. He had he was the oh, one that's that nice. yeah. So it's someone with a with brains and also kind of a a strategic sense of where he wanted to go, and where he wanted to go was to build this this network of proxy groups that would help Iran and would be essentially its foreign arms uh, in the region particularly. But, um, you know, he wanted it not just to be a bunch of crazy groups with guns, but groups that were integrated within government structures. And it was his vision to turn these, uh, you know, proxy groups in Iraq from being fringe groups to being kind of, you know, the guys that were organized to fight ISIS or however they got started into being political parties, to being part of the system and being members of the government. And that's what you have now, where they've gone from being sort of outsiders to being insiders in Iraq particularly, and also in Syria to some extent too. And Hezbollah is the same model. They're, they're politically powerful as well as having guns and, and sometimes some pretty crazy ideas. And Soleimani was the guy the White House whacked in January 2020. Yeah, for context and for I must say there's uh, no regret, no tears shed uh, by Republicans or Democrats that he was taken out. Yeah. It was uh, there was a lot of worry early on that uh, Iran was going to seek um, retribution in some some way. Maybe a, a big terrorist attack could still happen because Iran has a different timetable than we do. Sure, but the fact that he was taken out was definitely it was taking a, a very capable, very smart guy who had high ambitions for what uh, some of these militia groups could do in the region. Now, who replaced him? So there's been a, a, a there's been several others who've kind of risen to the top. None with the charisma and none with the with the vision that that Salmani had. He was kind of a one of a kind. Uh, we don't see anyone who's followed him that's been in the same league. He mm-hmm. was a he was a uniquely dangerous person. Are there factions within the government that are like you mentioned ones that are even harder line than yeah. the Ayatollah? But I assume there's also factions that are maybe to the left of the Ayatollah that perhaps don't like the United States, but, you know, could sit there and have a beer with them if they had to. Is, yeah. is that a thing? Yeah, absolutely. And and there have been times in the past where some of those guys have uh, have, have been ascendant and have been helpful to us. After the um, after 9-11, there was actually a period where um, there were meetings between what was then the, the George W. Bush administration and some, some Iranians who who they don't like Al Qaeda either, right? Because they're Sunni. Yeah, right. and so they were they were looking at ways that they could be helpful to us. Uh, those efforts were pretty much turned back. We didn't want to get into business with them, 
but there are there are pragmatic politicians in in Iran that would like to see a more moderate policy that mm. aren't cons that aren't are aren't as convinced that nuclear weapons would be a, a good way to go for Iran, and it, to the extent that we can support them and help them, uh, I think that's a good thing. We often see though they're they're be, they're often just excluded from the from politics in the country because if you're regarded as a moderate or somebody who's potentially willing to deal with the Americans, you're not allowed to run for office. You end up getting kind of pushed back and, and disqualified for whatever reason. So they, it's really hard for them to get much of a base. Mm. Now, you've been talking all about these proxy groups throughout this conversation. You mentioned Hezbollah. You mentioned Hamas, which that's a little separate right now. We'll get to that. Yemen. What were some of the other ones? So Khatib Hezbollah, which is the Iraqi group, one of the Iraqi groups. Okay. How So can we start with Hezbollah? And just explain this because I believe Soleimani, and I think you just said this, Soleimani was like the main yeah. leader of, of them. But when 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 was Hezbollah formed? Where do they operate out of? And what's their main objective? Yeah, so they kind of grew out of the, the Israeli, the con sort of long running conflict with Israelis, but they're essentially an anti Israel. That was that was their that's their reason for existing, and it's the Shiite Shiite militia groups all based. Um, mostly in, in southern Lebanon um, and also up in the Bekaa Valley, which is a little bit to the east, but um, you know, vehemently anti-Israel. Uh, they've they've armed themselves down to the point they have something like 150,000 rockets and missiles pointed at Israel. So if there ever was a conflict, that's the reason that that, that there's there's real fear about the Gaza crisis spreading to Lebanon because yeah. Hamas, you know, if it's it's awful, horrible group, but it was also fairly limited in its capabilities. It had a lot of rockets, but they weren't very sophisticated. Hezbollah's got the real deal. They've got a lot more rockets and they've got um, some guided systems so they could potentially have some precision strikes on on you know, nuclear plants or uh, you know military bases, airports. They could do a lot of damage in a hurry. Yeah, and I see that I'm looking on Wikipedia on the side here. I'm seeing their size is around like a hundred thousand people. Yeah, it's a huge thing, and that's their Oof. that's their armed force. And they've been fighting in in uh, Syria now because they became directly involved in the Syrian conflict. And so there's a generation of fighters that have combat experience from their time in Syria. And what was the name of the one in Iraq you mentioned there? Oh, Khatib Hezbollah. Okay, so that's ba am I right in saying that's like a estuary of Hezbollah yeah. itself? So it's they're not directly related but they it's all kind of hezbollah meaning it's party of god and so that's uh it's oh, essentially nice. yeah <laughs> it's nice to have that kind of authority yeah. i guess but there's gosh there must be 20 or or 25 groups like that in in iraq khatib hezbollah is one of the more prominent ones and, and are they i assume they're the people who are like helping create the underground railroad between yep. Iran yeah. Yeah. and Syria. <laughs> and they're well armed now. So they're the ones that every every now and then, you know, see missiles lobbed at a at an army base that where Americans are based. Oh my god. And it's it's typically them and then there's one other group that's that has a lot of that uh, capability. Okay. So October 7th happens. That is an Israel Hamas situation. I want to come to that in a second. But you mentioned Hezbollah, there being an issue there in Lebanon now, potentially. I remember in the days after that, maybe like October 9th, October 10th, whatever it was, there was military conflict between some Hezbollah guys, I want to say, and Israel on yeah. the northern border. Yeah. But that has since died down? It's died down in the news, but it's happening almost every week. There's been a few attacks. There's and it's it's what a lot kind of, of what kind of attacks? We so it, it looks some of it looks symbolic. It, it, there's there's a sense that Hezbollah doesn't really want to get deeply involved in this, but they want to show the colors. They want to to show you know their their comrades in arms in Gaza that they're on their side. So it's 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 mostly just an occasional rocket attack at a long distance attack on a, on an Israeli base. Or rockets will fall on an Israeli village near the border, which are mostly evacuated now. There's not a lot of people who live there, but it's surprisingly regular, and it's a little bit, you know, it's 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 showing the flag, but it's more dangerous than that because there's always the potential that they're going to hit something big, and the Israelis are going to retaliate because they have to. 
And then if they do, then Hezbollah may do something else. So this tit for tat exchange could get you know really really um, ugly quickly. Okay, and, and and that's the that's always the fear. And with all the proxy groups, it's this way right now. Even the even the Houthis, because they mm. haven't struck a lot of things, but say they did. What if they killed? What if they hit a, a you know a navy destroyer and and killed some sailors? Big deal. Big deal. And mm. we'd have to come after them a big way because you know we just couldn't ignore that. Uh, and so there's a fear that. Hezbollah will hit something in Israel that's that's uh, so hurtful that Israelis will be forced to respond in a big way, and then suddenly Lebanon is dragged into the war too. How closely allied and in, in communicado with each other are Hezbollah and Hamas? Yeah, so they've had an off and on relationship because they, you know, Hamas is is a Sunni group, and so they don't have it's the same affinities that they. Right. Um, it, they actually were on different sides in the Syrian conflict. There was a split between them because they they don't like mm. Assad, and so they 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 kind of broke with Hezbollah for for a bit. That's like the you ever seen that meme of the Bloods and Crips holding up the things together? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. It's like Hamas <laughs> and Israel. Like yeah, we don't like that guy though. Yeah, that's right. The, the <laughs> enemy of our enemy. Or and and but that um, but then just just in the last few years before the crisis, you saw them kind of make up, and mm. there were. Lots of delegations um, traveling to to Lebanon for meetings, for training. We think there was a significant amount of training of some of the Hamas cadres that were in the, ended up getting in, involved in the in the Gaza crisis. So they do they do help each other. Um, they're certainly strong allies, but Hezbollah so far just doesn't want to go into it full you know full fledged. They're just waiting on the, on the wings. And I guess similarly to what we were talking about with Hezbollah for background here, what is what is the history of Hamas and was Iran involved from day one? Mm. So they, yeah, they, they grew out of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, movement, which is a strictly a Sunni movement, anti-Israel sort of uh, hardline uh, resistance to Israeli, you know, you know, Israeli control of, of Palestinian territory. They, that's what they've been all about since the earliest days. Uh, they've, you know, I, 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 the deeper I get into the history of, of the Palestinians and the different factions and, and groups, um, they sometimes fight each other more than they fight the Israelis. Mm. They, the, you know, the the, uh, got the Hamas people fighting and killing members of the PLO, the Fatah movement, and they've yes. they've been bitter enemies at times as well. Um, and they, Hamas as an organization, has objected to the idea of any kind of a combination with Israel. Anything that recognizes Israel's right to exist, they've um, they've seen as wrongheaded and they've opposed it. And that's why their continued presence uh, is such a problem for the Israelis because they think that there can't be any peace in that region with Hezbollah having any kind of, of, of serious control of territory because because they've, they've said publicly they, they would strike Israel again if they get a chance. <sighs> All right, I want to be... Careful how we navigate all this, because obviously there's an ongoing war. It's horrible. No one likes to see people getting killed left and right. Obviously, what happened at the beginning was terrible. There's seemingly a huge lose-lose across the board situation yeah. here. I'm almost, I'm not cynical, but like I'm almost like, God damn it, like what's what's even a solution here? Yeah. But Alessia, I don't know if you can pull this up. 2019. Google this, 2019 Netanyahu Hamas funding. Mm. Yeah, I know this, where I'm going I this. can't get out of my, you know, I know where I'm, I'm going. Like it's, I, I can't get this out of my head when it, when I saw this and I, and, and I'm somebody, there are two leaders that I have studied over the past four or five years extensively around the world, Vladimir Putin and Benjamin Netanyahu. Mm. I've read thousands of pages on these guys. I've read Netanyahu's personal biography the whole bit, you know, things biographies that were written more against him, stuff like that. And he he is a very very complicated guy. I even said there was some conversation I had about it on the podcast with you over a year ago where some of it Looking back on it, I thought about it after. I'm like, I feel like that's misinformed. So I got more into him. I'd really been a Putin guy. And then, you know, I'd looked at some Netanyahu, but I really got deep on him last year before all this conflict happened, ironically. But there, this quote, grab this one, Alessi, for years, Netanyahu propped up Hamas. Okay. So down, yeah. This is from the Times of Israel. And this has been reported in a lot of places. But according to various reports, 
Netanyahu made a similar point at a Likud faction meeting in early 2019 when he was quoted as saying that those who oppose a Palestinian state should put, should support the transfer of funds to Gaza because maintaining the separation between the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and Hamas in Gaza would prevent the establishment of a Palestinian state. So translating that into English, what that would mean if this quoted report is true, which is worth a question like, oh, are some of his enemies trying to misquote him? But that would mean he's saying, let's give money to Hamas because they'll be separate from PLO. They'll also wreak havoc if we do that. I don't know. Yeah. It'll, you know, we'll we'll have some excuse to be able to go in there and clean stuff up. Now, obviously, nobody ever wants to see what what happened and and what went down there. But you have to wonder on his personal history with this if there's a deeper point here yeah. because he actually. He was prime minister from, I want to say, 96 to 99, and then he was voted out in favor of that guy who's friends with Epstein. What the hell's his name again? Uh, uh, what was the prime minister's name? Why was it Barack? Bar- or, Bar- yeah, Ahud yeah, Barak. <laughs> and then he became once, – once Shimon Perez got back in charge, he became the finance minister. So he – Netanyahu did. So he was high up in the cabinet and he ended up after having some actually like a successful run very successful for israel a a a run as finance minister he resigned from the government because of the original deal they made to give the land to gaza like that was his red line he's like you cannot do this if you do this i will resign (laughs) right (laughs) and so he then stepped away from the government. Eventually, three years later, it gets voted in as prime minister, but Gaza's already been given up. So this Gaza thing was a personal pain point to him because actually in his defense, I'll say this, he's like, why are we going to put something right in our backyard yeah. that's going to end up having problems with it? Fast forward 13 years later, he's quoting saying, well, it's in our backyard, but if we want to get rid of it, maybe we should fund the people in there that are causing the most chaos. Yeah. Have you gotten any sources or anyone around the situation who can speak to the veracity, like how real this quote is, or if if there is some sort of, you know, espionage type activity to prop up an evil group like Hamas such that they can have the mandate to be able to say, all right, let's get them out of there? Yeah. Well, you know, certain things are absolutely true and, and just verifiable as far as I'm I'm concerned. And one is that that Netanyahu in particular and his, his government in general it adopted a policy to to prop up Hamas. And that that happened over several years. And I've seen the documents, you know, the Israeli government thanking Qatar, who was um, essentially the, kind of the conduit for a lot of the money that came to Hamas. But they said, yeah, yeah, this is great. <laughs> so is, it, is there a situation where there was actually suitcases full of cash that were coming to Hamas to keep them going? And the idea suitcases was suitcases full, full, of, full cash. of cash. Yeah, and then it got a little more sophisticated than that. But in the beginning, <laughs> it was literally suitcases full of cash, and and the sort of the the difficulty that I think the Israelis as as a country are wrestling with is the fact that the, a a bet was made if that you can kind of divide and separate. We can contain Hamas because they're in this little area. They're not going to get out. We've got this this really great defensive system around Gaza, so they're not going to cause any trouble for us. Will make them, you know, prosperous enough that they're just going to be fat and happy and not not be a problem for us. And but because it, the Hamas and and the, the Palestinian, you know, authority don't like each other, it's a way of kind of splitting those two apart. Going to keep them opposed to one one another, and it's going to be impossible to have a Palestinian state because of this conflict. Mm-hmm. Essentially, it's a way to prolong this very ambiguous situation where there's. You know, some leaders say that we eventually favor a two-state solution, but but in practicality, they're they're doing everything they can against that to make sure it doesn't right. ever happen. And and I, th- I think Nahu embraced embraced that 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 strategy, you know, wholeheartedly. And you know, his fingerprints are all over the you know, this 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 supporting of Hamas with with funding. And it um, you know, I think as part of the reckoning that's eventually going to have to happen. I'm, not going to have, begin to be able to tell Israelis how to vote, but when when there is a political reckoning in Israel, when there are elections, you know people are thinking about this, about the decisions that were made, you know, over years to to in, in a way enable Hamas 
thinking that they would be controlled and they would never be able to do something like they did on, on October 7, which surprised and shocked everybody. Yes. Nobody thought Hamas could pull off something like that. How did they do it? Because I, I, I know how good Mossad is. Yeah. You want to talk about a swing and a miss? Yeah. I mean, you can't take a shit along that Gaza border without there being patrolmen. How did these guys get across and do this? Yeah, they had a really good intel, and we're still not sure exactly how they got all of it. Uh, the Iranians probably helped, but they had a, a pretty good sense of exactly when to do it, uh, what parts of you know they, uh, you know, where to send their forces, where to go over the wall. Um, they had this sort of all the kibbutzes and the, and the bases mapped out to to the square meter where they were going to go and what they were going to do. It was a very, very sophisticated operation. And it was low tech in a way. And we kept thinking that we were going to see more impressive weapons from the from Hamas than, than we we eventually saw. But they were really good at what they what they had. And um, and so there was just this element of surprise. The Israelis did not think that an attack was coming from Gaza. They just didn't see it. Uh, they should have seen. There were lots of warning signs that could be, that could be read later. Uh, a lot of that evidence, just like with our 9/11 situation, was ignored or misread. Mm. And so, and and Hezbollah got got lucky in some ways too. They managed to they did it on a on a on a Sabbath on a holiday when right. when when some of these uh, observation stations were not looking for anything. Um, and 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 they were vicious. They um, I know in this country we were quite surprised too. But the Israelis and I've talked to. A lot of folks in IDF and in the intel community, and they—they've, yeah, everybody's fully, you know, candid about this. We really were fooled. We really didn't see it coming. Uh, it's one of the greatest failings in our history to to let this happen to us. Now you were over there in Jordan along the Syria border, like you said. But when we were talking before camera, you were saying obviously parts of the reason you've been over there is to cover this war. Yeah, what's going on? Which, by the way, how's your boy King Abdullah doing? <laughs> <laughs> he's, um, he's, gosh, it's, um, it's, it, it's, it's excruciating for him because, yeah. um, you know, clearly half his country are there are Palestinians. He's married to a Palestinian yes, woman. Yes, he is. Uh, but he also has a kind of a he has a long range vision of of the region and what he thinks should happen and what he wants to happen is for there to be a uh, a, a free Dem uh, Palestinian society, a place where people can, you know, maybe it's demilitarized, maybe there's some way that they, it can happen that um, that Israel can accept in terms of security threats. But uh, if you don't solve that basic problem of giving Palestinians some self-determination and some, some ability to, to direct their own destiny, then this, this, this problem is just going right. to pop up again and again and again. And in fact, you just create more martyrs, more suicide bombers right. with every every death in Gaza. So he's seeing all this, he's he's worried about it. Um and and yet he feels like there's there's these insurmountable, if I could speak for him, difficulties. There are people that just just are standing in the way of any mm -hmm. kind of solution, one of them being Netanyahu and the other being Hamas, which is, neither yes. one of them are willing to compromise. Yes. And and until <laughs> it, it just you almost have to look beyond those two into some future where where you have more sort of reasonable uh, you know partners for negotiation that uh, that you can get some kind of solution. So you've had some. Am I hearing this correctly? You've had some private conversations with him since the war broke out. Yeah, I don't want to talk about um, the extent, but yeah, sure. we've um, yeah, I've had been been lucky enough to have several meetings with him. So. Yeah, we we laid out on episode one thirty four when Joby was last here. We talked all about black flags and, and a lot of other stuff too, but we laid out your whole relationship with the king over the years, which is a very, very fascinating relationship and how that got formed. And that guy's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, he really, like I said, you know, in America where the kings and queens thing, we go, I don't know about that. Yeah. But he didn't want power. Yep. He is, he's very aware of his region, but also westernized in like all the good ways and a, a really calm solid leader who's self-reflective which you i mean you'd think like king and self-reflection like yeah. that usually doesn't go hand in hand but it was funny my friend remy adeleke navy seal who i had on here trident can really the power that comes with it the uh accolades that come with it it's not good at times what do you mean in my opinion no human being was created to be worshipped by another human being 
you know, when you're a SEAL, go to the base that's not the SEAL base, you go to NAB or go to another base and you have that trident on, everybody stops and they look and like, oh crap, like you're a SEAL. And it's, it's like that can build up pride within the person. And there's been guys who, you know, it's been too much power. Here is boys with him too. Oh, no He's like, oh dude, he's the best. Yeah. But he, he made a really interesting point. He was given, he was spitting some fire at the beginning of this war when you know he was at the king when he was at different conferences and stuff but people can go look this up and, and watch some of the things he said but one of the things he was pointing to is a, a common complaint that was being wielded against places like jordan and countries that were speaking like hey we got to get to peace in this war was that okay well why don't you take in the palestinians yeah and he actually in my opinion gave a, a really eloquent explanation saying, look, don't like Hamas, like you said, don't like the hardline stance in Israel on some of this vis-a-vis -vis peace. But if we take in the Palestinians, it's not that we're not taking them because like the idea was that they're saying, oh, those countries think they're garbage or yeah. something. He's like, yeah. that's not what it is. If we take them in, we are we are we are going to allow the ethnic cleansing of the region. Yeah, that's because true. those people will leave. Do, yeah. do, you, do you agree with that? Yeah, that's and and that's something the Palestinians are really sensitive to. And even in, in Gaza, because there's suggestions, well, why do why do you live in this this you know prison? Why, why don't you go somewhere that's else? Right. But they don't. They they are intensely protective of their what they see as their homeland, and to to and to, to any sense that they're going to lose that little bit of. Dignity or, or, or uh, you know identity or geography that they have is is just deeply offensive and and in addition to all the, those concerns the the Jordanians are just overwhelmed as it is with with refugee problems they've got mm. you know Syria the Syrian conflict something I don't know it's like a million and a half um, Syrians ended up coming into to Jordan some how many live, people live in Jordan it's so it, it increased the population of the country by about 20 percent holy shit. so yeah you know, the whole country had like six million people and then you get these waves of people some settling in a in semi-permanent refugee camps on the border but many more of them just coming into the towns coming into Amman and to some of the northern cities which are now just like a huge populations of Syrians and you know Jordan has to provide schooling has to provide you know housing has to provide Water, which Jordan doesn't have, it's one of the most water poor countries in really? the world. They have no, they have no rivers. There's a trickle of a thing called the Jordan River. It's 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 really as a as a waterway. It's not much at all. There's no there are no lakes. Um, they, they've they've tried various things like piping water from the from the Red Sea up or the Dead Sea rather up to to Jordan and and, and running it through desal desalination plants, but they don't have enough water for for to, for agriculture or for people to drink. And to have suddenly like a, a million more more mouths to, to to feed and more people to provide water to, they don't have energy, they don't have gas and oil, mm. um, and so every time, you know, there's still people living in Jordan from the Iraq War and, and then uh, you know 20 years ago, so it, people kind of come there because it's a fairly safe, sane, you know, you know, quiet place, and then they never leave. Um, so it's a, the last thing that uh, that Jordan needs is another big Palestinian or a big, big refugee crisis that sends more people into their country. And to see, certainly to see Israel's perspective on this, and I, I fully understand this, it's like you have this patch of land, right? You tried to compromise to give it to people to live there. Now it is geographically separated from the other part of their country, which makes it problematic. You did basically have to box them in, and I get that because you look at it, you, there's four borders. On one side, there's the sea, and once – I forget what it is. Maybe it's like three miles out. It becomes Israeli territory, yeah. and that's where all the fish are, so they can't go out there. On the north and east sides, it's Israel, and it's like I tell people, I'm like, look, since Hamas is there and people who hate them are there, imagine if like Iraq in 2006 were where Mexico is. Yeah, yeah. Good We'd point. all want a wall. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like there's people who want a wall right now, yeah. but like you really want one yeah. for that. So like you'd never be letting people in. And then on the south side, it borders Egypt, but like the Sinai Peninsula is a no man's yeah. land. And it's it's only – it's not even really – some of it's not inhabitable. And it's only inhabited in the places it is by terror groups. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. So ISIS had a big presence in Sinai. Of course still, it, it still has people there. And the Egyptians don't want – just don't want the Palestinians. They, they're adamant about it. Um, and so there's really no place for the for, for the people from Gaza to go. They're not allowed to, to cross that border. 
And, um, and you're right. I've spent some time in the Sinai and it's, it's an extreme desert. You've been say. there for yeah, a while? It's, it's, uh, it's, Looks like a moonscape, a lot of it. And um, is there like a hotel out there, like a Long John <laughs> there Silver's? Is a, there like, is a little on? resort on the coast, actually, but um, but the you know most of the the peninsula is, is just uh, kind of a wasteland. So what were you doing out there? Um, so I've, I made several trips to Egypt, so that was just on one of my my little excursions. Um, so it's a great perk of my job. I get to go to interesting places and want to have a few extra days. Um, you you know, just take a someplace. drive out there yeah, by yourself. To, yeah, well, with 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 someone else. Yeah, like security. Or a, somebody just knows the area and uh, gives my local guide. It's making me a little nervous. I don't know about that. You know, there's some, a lot of dudes with AKs along yeah. those roads. Yeah, I just have to know. You have to be with somebody who knows the turf and okay. get to stay out of trouble. All right, fair enough. So where where does this – when was the last time you were there again? November? Is that right? Yeah. No, okay. sorry. To February. Oh, you were just, just there just in just February. Last, yeah. And that was in Jordan. Yeah, that's Jordan up to Syria. Okay, because you, you can't get into Gaza, obviously. No, no unless you, you're embedded. You, yeah, you could get in. Yeah, I, I guess like some of the war reporters. Who's who's Paul Rosley's by Matt Gutman, who mm-hmm. I think may come on the podcast. I think I think he's been there. I got to check on that. He's definitely been in Israel during like a lot of this time. But w- you know what's what's the status there? I mean, I, I'm very careful with what I believe because there is propaganda from yeah. every angle, Absolutely. from both sides. Yeah. You know, you see your Hamas actors, you see your Israeli claims that, you know, the government's just pushing. But I, you know, I hate war. I think that makes me normal, I hope. But there's so many people, it appears, regardless of what the numbers are, who are dying. Mm. And there seems to be no end in sight. And yes, it does seem like Hamas is unreasonable and doesn't want to have ceasefires. But there's a lot of people there who are living under their thumb that probably do want that like what, what what's happened take me there what, what's happening yeah i think the big disappointment um among many actually is um this kind of this notion that that hamas could be cleared out quickly and that just mm. hasn't happened and it may not be possible and um at least in the in the way the israelis want it to happen so there, there were all these predictions well this will be this hot campaign but by you know sometime in january it'll be over and then we'll figure out how to pacify the place and what what look what happens next, and that flood you know well by sometime in February or by Ramadan surely like God help us if we don't have this thing settled by Ramadan and it's not only is not settled but now you have a situation where Israel is having to go yeah. back into places in the north got this new siege uh, that's that I guess is just wrapping up at um, uh, at Al Shiba Hospital where there's you know a lot of, a lot of controversy and fighting yes. before and now it's back again because it turns out that Hamas went back and reoccupied the hospital and there's been like four or five days of pretty intense fighting. Which is a real, by the way, that is, a, and you would know better than me even, but like talking to some of my guys who have been over there and I'll quote one of them like Remy Adeleke who literally was like embedded. It is a real thing. Like they do use hospitals. They yeah. do use ambulances to get around. They do use schools sometimes. Does that mean they're using all of them? And does Israel sometimes use that as carte blanche to say, oh, it's a school. They're using it. Yes. But they do use them. Yep. No? Yep. And the tunnel thing is, is a real thing. And that's yeah. uh, the more we get into that and just to get, get a sense of how sophisticated these tunnels are. And it's like the, the New York subway. It's this massive project that took them obviously, you know, 15 years to build and underground, you know, are not just like bunkers and hideouts, but weapons factories. And, and it just, the, the tragedy is they spent all this money building this defensive or this military network while the country was, you know, almost starving. I'm saying right. like, you're, you're not, you're instead of building useful infrastructure, you're building, you know, this, this, uh, fortress and you just, it just seems incredibly unfair to people who have to have to live there. So, and, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of the big logistical problems with this, this uh, conflict for the Israelis has been, uh, what do you do about these tunnels? It's, they're, they're so massive. There's so many tunnels and so many miles of them is just how to neutralize them so that Hamas can't use them again. There's, and there's hostages down there. Hostages allegedly. down there. They've, they've been, uh, there've been some efforts to flood the tunnels, taking seawater and just pumping it in. It's just try to- Which would kill the hostages. Which will kill the hostages from the, in the wrong places. Other places, they feel like they're, if they feel confident that the hostages aren't here in the north, 
then if you flood the tunnels with seawater, they may not be usable again for, you know, for a long time. Um, so, but they're, they're trying to come up with engineering solutions for, for dealing with these things. But it's, um, it, it is a problem that despite, you know, predictions that it's, it's going to get solved quickly. It just, you, you can't completely defeat Hamas. Just that can't happen. Um, it just the idea it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, um, not just in Gaza, but but in other areas too. I mean, Hamas has become heroes uh, in, in yeah. the Palestinian territory, and that's not not an outcome that uh, you want to see. What kind of percentage are they heroes to? Well, I mean... Ballpark. <laughs> I can tell you that an overwhelming majority of people, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to get good polling because right. it's hard to yeah. do polling in that part of the world. But when people are asked, you know, would you prefer living under the, the, the Fatah, the Palestinian Authority, or under Hamas, it's, uh, um, you know, the, at least in, 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 the, in the West Bank right now, Hamas is more popular by far. In the West Bank? In the West Bank. So we're not talking about Gaza, we're, we're talking about West Bank. We're yeah. talking about away from it. And, you know, in Jordan, you know, I'm talking to ordinary people who have, you know, no dog in this fight, but they, they, they look at uh, what Hamas has done as, as heroic. And it's it's hard for me to get my head around because it's really? the kind of the barbarity that we all saw, but they um, they 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 you know they're sort of anti-Israel in their outlook and and they're just glad to see somebody beat up on the Israelis, even if it, it even at such great costs, even um, if it's civilians, even if civilians and, doing and unspeakable I'm talking to to young people who who go to clubs and you know like wear Western clothes and and look pretty Western, but somehow sympathize with Hamas, which is hard to imagine because right. they wouldn't want to live under them, I don't think. Uh, they would, because that would just be, you know, forget the bars and the clubs and the, and, you know, the, the Western clothes. It's a fairly repressive um, autocratic system. But they've, this, this conflict has turned Hamas into heroes for a lot of those young people. That's so bizarre. What, what do you, th so, <sighs> I like to look at the, like, weird as this is, I like to look at the marketing of these things, how wars are marketed, mm -hmm. which is propaganda. Let's yep. call it what it is. And I have been expressing concerns since about three days into the conflict about the strategy of the Israeli government in this. They, at the beginning, they had a lot of sympathy, obviously, at the very beginning because... You know, they were, their civilians were attacked. It's barbaric what happened. But then it became this almost tragedy porn yeah. format of it, yeah. meaning it wasn't good enough to say babies were killed. We had to keep spreading that like they were definitely beheaded and then have arguments over whether or not babies were mutilated or beheaded, which it, it, to me should be irrelevant. Yeah. Like babies were killed. That's horrible. Then they had to, you know, they had to go on every station and anything that was even questioning anything was anti-Semitic. Yeah. And I'm like, this is going to piss people off who agree with you. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, from what I have seen, take it anecdotally, take it as you will, the sentiment in this country, yeah. they yeah. don't fuck with Israel. Yeah. And some of the and I don't I don't fuck with Hamas at all. I don't, I don't like them at all. It's it's horrible. That's why I'm like some of that stuff when 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 I see like trans lives matter out there talking about yay Hamas, I'm like, yeah. oh my God, yeah. you would you would be like executed in two seconds. But like you know, you can kind of look at it both ways and say, all right, this is a terror group that's bad. What are we doing over here? Why are we mortar bombing places, leveling them? There, there was one, like the Israeli government even admitted to this one where this was, this had to be like four or five months ago, where they did admit they attacked like a refugee base because yeah. there was one guy there. Yeah. So they went after one, you know, maybe mid-level Hamas guy and killed God knows how many people, men, women, and children. It's like you are creating the next generation of people who are going to hate you so yeah. that when you are interviewing people outside of clubs 20 years from now, which I'm sure you still will be, you know, those young people will be like, yeah, fuck Israel. Yeah. You know, we, we love them. Like they'll say stuff like that. Like yeah. how, wh how do you think they get out of this from a PR perspective? It's a very deep hole, I think. And it's, and it, you know, the, the thing that I get from my work is, is, is you get to see the complexity of situations that, 
nothing is is ever just reducible to sound bites or slogans. It's always a lot more complicated than you think it is. But a few things are absolutely clear, and one is that is, Israel's lost the, the sort of the, the PR war in this this conflict. That public sentiment, particularly internationally, not not as much in the United States as in other countries, but it's swung so heavily against Israel that it's going to take a very long time to to get out. And there's no there's no kind of day after plan that that looks to me as a, as, a, as a reasonable way to kind of get us on a better trajectory. That's what feels so hopeless about this is that I don't know how we get out of this. And, and if you're right. Israel, how you get to a point where, uh, you know, this, you, you can kind of, you know, cleanse this, the stain that this, that Hamas has, be, that Gaza has become for them. It's just, it's, it's its own separate tragedy. And there are lots of people of good will that, that, that want to see, Good things come out of this, but they're, 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 you know, just the conversations I have now are just so d depressing, and um, so I don't know. I, and I, I do worry, and I think you're absolutely right in saying that the the thing that is most alarming is the fact that we're this is probably just the start. You know, this is a, yeah. a very discreet moment in history, but every time there's a there's a conflict like this, there's as a generation of people that's impacted by it, and that you get a whole new terrorist movement or, or or a wave of terrorism that comes out of this because people are, are angry and they want revenge. I heard this story. I'm trying to remember who told me this, but it's, I think it was one of the conversations I had with, with the officials in Jordan about a doctor in, in Gaza who saw his entire family wiped oh, out, yeah. Yeah. except for one girl. Yes. I know this, this doc, Alessi, can you pull this up? Piers Morgan, Piers Morgan, Palestinian doctor, family. Yeah, pull this. I'm gonna pull this guy up. This guy's amazing. Yeah, and he 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 advocates for peace. Yeah, he's he's delivered. He worked in an Israeli hospital and delivered Israeli babies. Like yeah. that's his job. Yeah, and and yet you worry that that uh, that there's so much hatred being generated in in this you know right now that well, let's maybe listen to a little of this. Yeah, I don't know if we can because it's Piers' stuff. But what's this guy's name? What, what Nobel Peace Prize? Oh. So is is it I, I, yeah. I remembered how to say this now I'm gonna fuck it up Isildeen Abelesh. that sounds right yes that was him yeah so have you ever heard that tape of him talking to the Israeli media while his family's being found dead no I haven't heard that but seems... actually we can play this Alessi type in Isildeen Abelesh into yeah. YouTube yep calls Israeli media daughters I, I, I want i want people to hear this because this is just this is great this was years ago now this is i want to say oh nine go down all right guys second one al jazeera got gaza doctors family caught on camera so he was pause this for one second lessy he was friends with this is an israeli news station he was friends with the anchor on tv wow and what happened was his building was hit with a rocket now he he's not a threat. It was a mistake. They thought there was a threat there. They hit his building with a rocket and they killed he has like eight kids. They killed like three of his daughters. They killed nieces, whatever, and he was calling in as he was finding the bodies. Go ahead and play it, Alessi. Is the volume on? Call to a doctor in Gaza who's been reporting daily for an Israeli station. His three daughters have just been killed. <laughs> They've killed his family, he says. I think I'm a bit overwhelmed too. He then explains that Dr. Abul Aish is a Palestinian physician who's worked for years at an Israeli hospital. Who was hurt, he asks. My guys, my girl, Shlomi, can't anybody help us, please? He has eight children, the journalist explained. Maybe we can do something to help. Abu Laish, where is your house? The cameras then follow the journalist as he tries to use his contacts to send ambulances to help the survivors. Incredibly, he succeeds. The Israeli army allows a Palestinian ambulance to go straight to the Eretz border crossing. From there, the injured are transferred onto Israeli ambulances 
and taken to Israeli hospitals. Not him. Among them, mm. one of the daughters who survived. <laughs> For the most part of this 22-day war, Israeli journalists were not allowed to report from inside Gaza. And Dr. Abul Aish, a Hebrew speaker, was one of the rare voices bringing the reality of the Palestinian suffering into the Israeli living rooms. Everybody in Israel knows that I was talking on television and on the radio that we are at home, that we are innocent people. Suddenly today, when there was hope for ceasefire, on the last day I was talking to my children, suddenly they bombed us. Is that how you treat a doctor who takes care of Israeli patients? Is that what's done? Is this peace? All right, that's good, Alessi. Now, remarkably, this guy has such a... I'm so glad you brought him up. He has such an amazing outlook that he's like a peacemaker yeah but who would have been able to blame him if he became like a Hamas supporter because yeah. this is a guy delivering israeli babies in their hospitals every day yeah and that's what they do to him. it's just you know i know it's complicated but sometimes it feels careless yeah and the character in the, my first book the triple agent the sabalawi was uh, was a doctor as well yeah. worked as uh in a palestinian clinic for for pediatric pedi uh, pediatrics and um, but was radicalized by fighting in Gaza in 2008. And so it ends up becoming, um, you know, eventually a, a volunteer for Al Qaeda. Mm. And uh, this is someone who's educated. He speaks English. He's, he's Western in many ways. But it is possible and pretty predictable that if, if uh, people are exposed to trauma like that, they, they look for ways to strike back. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, it's in lethal ways. And that's what happened in the case of the triple agent. Absolutely. How, how do you... I mean, you said right at the outset of this part of the conversation, you're like, well, Hamas, uh, at some point, it's, it might be going away. Do, do you see this ending as not until Israel has wiped Hamas off the earth? They're going to have to be satisfied that, that Hamas can't have political control, at least in the in the near future. And I don't know exactly how they manage that because they don't want to they don't want to own Gaza. That's just a horrible outcome for right. for them. Um, the the best that that I think people can hope for is that there's that the Arabs collectively the, the the Gulf states with their money the so the Palestinians the Jordanians West bankers and others can come up with a with a formula for you know some kind of governance uh, that excludes Hamas and they're gonna have to be very careful about how they do that um, but there can't be a Hamas you know, any kind of real Hamas authority left in Gaza for there to be any kind of peaceful outcome. I think until that group is is really driven out or driven underground, as is sometimes is the case, the Israelis aren't going to give up because they're, they they want to see them absolutely crushed. And it's interesting, I think most most people in the region who, who are going to favor a two-state solution all kind of recognize that two-state solution is, is not possible with a Hamas in control of right. any any part of, of Palestinian territory, um, so it's it's the most complicated, difficult operation that you can imagine. But that's the only way that you can begin to have a sense of some kind of normalcy is if it's, it's, there's a, another a, a governing authority in that area that doesn't have the same kind of radical aspirations that Hamas does, and but yet has legitimacy with the people, and that's that's a lot of a lot of needles to thread. Sure. Have you spoken with Israelis over there? Oh, like, yeah. like you had said, you spoke with a lot of IDF guys and, and some military and intel related guys, but have you spoken with civilians as well? And, and do they have peace on their mind from what you gather or what, what, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, the, so I, my conversations range from the, the sort of the sources that we deal with, and a lot of these are, are either government, military, or intelligence, but also with ordinary people too, and including Israeli colleagues. We've got people who, who are reporters for the Washington Post who happen mm. to be Israeli citizens and live in the country and have experienced the you know the, the the crisis pretty much as you know any other normal person would over there. And you can't understate the the trauma that October 7 was because yeah. it seemed like everybody in Israel knew somebody who was affected personally, knew somebody who was killed or knew somebody who was in a, a kibbutz that was attacked. And so they're all quite shaken by this. It's also hard to get any of them to think about a Palestinian state as being something that would be good for the region 
because like we, we gave Gaza independence and look what it did. Look what happened, yeah. yeah, it's just, you know, as soon as you set it up, they're gonna come after us. And you can understand that that view. On the other hand, if, if there isn't some compromise, there isn't some way to give Palestinians a, a path to a state and some hopeful future, this is just a endless conflict. It's endless. And I f- feel like there's a, this, this is not universal, but among some Israeli government officials that I've spoken to over the years, they they accept the fact that these are unsolvable problems and that the best that anyone can hope for is to get through the next few years. I mean, they 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 view Iran this way. I mean, Iran is a the trajectory of Iran right now is is is, is pretty frightening, and and they and it's is it is an existential threat for the Israelis, and they they recognize that. But if they can figure out a way to kind of have peace in our time, that that uh, I mean, that's why I think people make deals with Hamas and and do kind of hypocritical and underhanded things to kind of support bad people because they see it as a way to have peace right now. Um, and I guess you can't blame them for that, but it's not a way to get a permanent solution to the problem. Yeah, it's it's tough because you have political factions too. Obviously, like Israelis are all about Israel. They have a good national pride there. But, you know, you look at back, in, back when Rabin made the deal with Arafat, with the PLO and the, what was that, the Oslo Accords in 93, yeah. right? He was then viewed, some supported that, others viewed him as a traitor. He yeah. ended up getting whacked by some crazy guy who disagreed with it, who assassinated yeah. him. And, you know, it brought in, then then Netanyahu won the election and it kind of pendulum shifted the other way. Like, we will never negotiate with a terrorist like Arafat. And sure, you can make some arguments that Arafat had certainly okayed some things that certainly were terrorists but it's like you know if you're gonna have peace you're never gonna get 100 yep. percent or even close to what you want yeah it has to be compromised and, and maybe you gotta deal I, I know people hate this line but you gotta deal with the devil you know yeah absolutely and it turned out to uh, arafat was among the most reasonable yes among the, the ones the israelis were dealing which with is the wild to say but yeah yeah but he actually it, it, there was a point where he came around and was willing to recognize Israel's right to exist and, and to want to negotiate some kind of solution with them. And it didn't work out, and he was uh, intransigent in his own ways, and, and kind of things fell apart. But but he, I think he genuinely aspired to have a, a peaceful uh, relationship with Israel. Have you, throughout all your work, because obviously you have a lot of intel contacts and stuff like that, have you ever had long conversations about the intelligence relationship between, say, CIA and Mossad mm. with any of these guys? And if so, what what do they say about that? Yeah, so it's it's a pretty close relationship, but it's not problem-free. Mm. Um, we, the, the CIA works very closely with a, with a number of countries. There's the, the, the five eyes, which right. are kind of our, our closest allies. But also, you know, the Jordanians are, are good allies. Their intelligence community is really good, and they and they work with us on a lot of things, particularly in counterterrorism. With the Israelis, it's um, there's a lot of sharing that goes on, but it's also clear that the, Is- the Israelis are are more concerned about their own. They they're sure. very micro focused on their own problems, um, and they don't necessarily w- want to help us if it's not in their interest too. It's it's a bit. Uh, I want to be careful how I state that, but it's I I can tell you from the American side, there's sometimes frustrations. Yes, that the Israelis will withhold information or they'll. Um, you know, they're 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 very very much seeing things through their own lens and not necessarily wanting to just to be good allies with us. Sometimes it's a little more complicated than just helping us. It's about uh, more about kind of keeping their own uh, system in, in good shape. I've heard similar sentiments from my much smaller stable than yours, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, cer- certainly heard that before. But are you? When, when's the next time you're headed back over there? So probably sometime later in the spring, I've got a new book in the in the works. I just Ooh. just started working on it. Um, can't talk about a lot of it yet, but it. Uh, Can we get a topic? So it's it's um, it, it's related to terrorism in the Middle East, but it's a little bit more historical. But there's mm. uh, there's a central character who's just one of the most fascinating people I've come across in a long time, and it's uh, he's still alive, and um, and I've got. Uh, I can't go into a lot, but I, there's a story that I, I need to tell about him. That's, I think it, it could be just in terms of an entertaining, dramatic story. It's one of the best I've come across. Whoa. So I'm looking forward to, to rolling that one out. 
This is going to be Pulitzer number three. Well, it's going to be a, <laughs> another conversation with Julian Doria. Oh, so we'll, it definitely we'll, will be. We'll, this this has been awesome. Like we, I didn't even stop to go to the bathroom during this. This was straight through. Ah, uh, it's amazing. I have it. You know, I'm keep going, but I really appreciate this. This yeah. has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for coming up. I I love talking about this stuff with you, just because like your knowledge of that entire region of the world. And by the way, stuff we didn't get to, like China and Russia and all this other shit. It's unbelievable. Wow. So we will put the links to Redline down there as well as Black Flags. And I also have the Triple Agent here, which is the book, once again, on El Bellowy, which you saw that story unfold in Zero Dark Thirty. You, sir, are a genius at writing. Love your books. Love talking to me about this. We'll do it again. It's a pleasure, man. All right. Good to see you. Everybody else, you know what it is. Give it a thought. Get back to me. Peace. Thank you guys for watching the episode. Before you leave, please be sure to hit that subscribe button and smash that like button on the video. It's a huge help. And also, if you're over on Instagram, be sure to follow the show at Julian Dory Podcast or also on my personal page at Julian D. Dory. Both links are in the description below. Finally, if you'd like to catch up on our latest episodes, use the Julian Dory Podcast playlist link in the description below. Thank you.